Yeah. Well, okay. At the, uh, Kylie is telling me the the Chinese uh, website, which we have the yeah. well, okay. the meeting on. Uh, they already have about Kylie uh, is telling me the about three hundred uh, fifty eight fifty nine now. I think it'll be a few thousand. <laughs> yeah. it, this is translated. Wow. Did you hear that, Sanford? Yes, they always translate uh, yeah. the meeting. Yeah, that's they, good. They have a very big company. Yeah. Yeah, they're very good uh, translation. Yeah. That's good. So, Vicente, yeah. we're going to start with you. Okay. As giving uh, a, a talk, like we said, about, you know, 12 minute talk on the cavernous sinus anatomy. Anatomy. And okay. Samford will give a talk <clears throat> about the, uh, the way to evolve from anatomy to, to a higher level of uh, clinical application of cavernous sinus surgery. He has a very nice okay. slide which shows how you know what surgery is to start with and how where to to go to, and then uh, Keith will be presenting a case of a schwannoma in the middle fossa, and then I asked Shashwat, "Hey Shashwat, you are mute. You're muted. Just, oh yeah, hey, yeah. hi. Hey, how are you? Yeah, hey everyone. Yeah, yeah I'm good. Nice to meet you. Good, good. So." We're still missing Dr. Al Mefti, Keith. He's here. He's here. Ah, oh, Keith is here. Okay. Yeah. I see. Ah, here you are. Hey, Keith. Good morning. Good morning. Sorry, we woke you up early, but that's <laughs> no can't problem. complain because it's even earlier for Gina. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, here's how we're gonna uh, progress. We. Uh, Vicente is going to start with a um, overview of the anatomy of the cavernous sinus, and Samford has a a nice uh, uh, slide that once he presented, which shows how he evolved from anatomy to the different stages of doing surgery uh, in the cavernous sinus. Um, which means like uh, which cases to start with operating uh, uh, around the cavernous sinus and then uh, how to dive into the cavernous sinus. Like, you know, you don't wanna start with a meningioma in the cavernous sinus in a way. And then uh, we'll have, uh, uh, now Sheshwat, you're presenting a case, right? Sheshwat, I, I, we cannot hear you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have like a, a few cases that I did in the beginning, like how I, uh, uh, where I found the transcavernous approach useful. And then I have a case where I found, where I faced difficulty, so. Okay, uh, good. So, yeah. so then uh, 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 I guess Keith, Keith, Keith will start the, uh, the third session will present <clears throat> like a, a case of a schwannoma in the cavernous sinus and how to navigate it, because this is like an evolution process of, and then you will show your cases and, and it'll be good you show what difficulty you uh, encountered. Yeah. And then I'll give my talk, which will yeah. lead to how to evolve into doing the surgery at a more advanced level in a way. So this will be like a build up of the whole process. And then I will go through the history and the, the, and the future of yeah. it. So uh, you are all carefully selected for a good reason. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. How many in China now? 
Seventy-three. All right, that's good. So we are we have a good 10, 11 minutes, and uh, it looks like the numbers are starting to build up here. And uh, Shashwat, what time is it in uh, India now? It's seven, uh, 7.20, 7.20 p.m. I see, yeah. okay. Yeah. Did you spread the word to the young people? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. All so right. there will be quite a few joining from my own department residents as well as uh, uh, colleagues. Did you also uh, uh, announce it on the skull base yeah. meet society? Okay. Yes. So how is the corona situation there? Like in India, it's still, we are still bogged down a little bit. Uh, our department is barely functional. Uh, like we are running around yeah. just two, two hours. So we, we are here. We are very, very busy. Uh, we're okay. still, yeah. uh, you know, I think yeah. what happened is a lot of the other hospitals now are uh, uh, filling with the uh, corona cases. So our hospital is not known for Corona, which is good, and it's known for the neuro. So now this created a more of a better situation for us because now we're having a lot of the neuro cases because they don't have place to go somewhere else. And also okay. yeah, yeah, people yeah. feel like if this is a neuro, we better send them to the neuro hospital. So our problem is we are, uh, we don't have enough space. We're full with predominantly neuro cases and uh, we're okay. struggling. Uh, the biggest challenge is the discharge because now every rehab wants you to do COVID testing and this delays patients okay. and COVID testing yeah. is not very available. So we end up keeping patients longer than they need before discharge. And this builds up the, you know, yeah. the, the patients unnecessarily. That's a, that's the biggest challenge. Nursing homes are not taking patients and rehabs are reluctant. And so that's really the challenge. It's a good challenge for us. It's not a, a bad one because it's mostly centered around us being busy. So. Did you hear that, Kate? What's that? Well, did you hear that? We're very busy. Great. <laughs> so if you're, not, if you're not busy there, you can come and be busy here. <laughs> <clears throat> Is it uh, still bad in uh, Arizona? Uh, yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's lined up a little bit in the, you know, the hospitals kind of are in a better place, but it's, yeah. You know, those capacity numbers, they say we're 90% capacity. It's, it's not true. You're not, we're 90% of the increased capacity. Yeah. You know, so the, the real hospital, you know, what the hospitals held uh, four months ago were 140% of capacity. Yeah. I know what you're saying. Yeah. I think Samford is the lucky one because okay. in Taiwan they managed it very well. And uh, you know, all the countries which have women running them are doing very well.
right, Gina? Yeah, you can say that again. <laughs> <laughs> That's very true. I think in India they need an Indira Gandhi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in India, fortunately, we don't have uh, so much uh, mobility. Like it's more of a scare in the media as compared to what we are seeing on the ground. Like oh. people are scared, but uh, it's not that serious like in the U.S. or where we had uh, some horrifying visuals coming from New York yeah. you know, when the epidemic was at peak. So the situation is not so bad. <laughs> but still, the number of cases are rising daily. They set off some kind of an alarm, like we have 50,000 cases. Then. But luckily, yeah. we, we are not seeing uh, so much uh, morbidity. Most of the people are doing just fine with the infection. Yeah. That's good. Well, you got TB there, which trains your immune system very well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, the lungs are, are used to much more difficult yeah. stuff. <laughs> Coronavirus has so much competition. Like <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> yeah, it's like an entrance for it, you know. <laughs> yeah. We need to score high, really high <laughs> to get a seat. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Hey. Hello, Dr. Abu. Hey. How So Dada Abu is now is live on YouTube. Yeah, it's uh, live on it's live on YouTube now. Uh -huh. Yeah. And later you will put the video on the YouTube. I mean, after the meeting. Yeah, it'll save so, it'll save to the channel. Mm -hmm. Gina, if I log in from the desktop at the same account that I'm here from the iPhone, does it make any difference or cause any problems? No, you can do that. I'll just re-add you as a panelist. Yeah, just I need to check uh, on the desktop the messages and all the things. Sure, yeah. If you want to sign into the desktop, I can add you again. Yeah, to clear confusion, we need to cancel one of these accounts. Next time. Yeah, you'll have to log out of your phone. 
to log into the computer though. Okay, if, I, if you need me, just call me on the on the phone. Okay. Okay. Uh, Gina? Yeah. Yes, I had a message earlier at 8.57 from a guy who's saying that, uh, hey, everyone, some something wrong with the Zoom. We see you only on YouTube. I mean, look, I see that person's message, but I wonder if that just means that something was wrong with their Zoom, because there's 36 people in here that I think it's working for. Yeah, actually, there's 43 already. It's yeah. Nice. So if somebody does have an issue on Zoom, though, the YouTube link is just the same, and they can chat on that as well. So if they have questions, like I can see all of that through YouTube. Okay. It's not just a view only. They can participate as well. How many we have? 450. We'll give just another few minutes when the numbers are building up here and and in China, there's already 450. No pressure. <laughs>
You've got about 31 people on YouTube too. Okay. You know, so far in, in my experience with these meetings, um, the timing, it's like uh, having a, the timing maybe like in, uh, in Spain, because it's the meeting supposed to start at eight, but everybody starts trickling in afterwards. <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, yeah, so. That's why um, in all the ones that I have participated in or we've done, it's always by 10 minutes afterward is when everybody is kind of uh, logged on in a way. And you can see the numbers going up now. It's like faster. We've also struggled with the time to see what's the best time to reach everybody around. I think this is the, the only disadvantage is the far, far east and where Taiwan and Japan is where the timing is a little bit late. Because it's midnight where Sanford is. 10 o'clock p.m. It's 10 o'clock, 10 p.m.? 10 p.m., yeah. 10 p.m., okay, not bad. Not bad. Except it's Saturday, so this is your party for tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so Gina, I will give just another three minutes and we'll get started. Okay, sounds good. How many people on the YouTube, Gina? 38. 38. Well, just a word for all the attendees. Uh, um, we will be starting in a couple of minutes around 9, 10 central time here.
what time is it in China? Like to leave? Uh, 10. 10. 10. 10. Yeah, how many people are there? 
so we don't give up on patients. So we put a, uh, a great uh, group of uh, individuals who will be giving their uh, uh, speeches first, and then I will follow with uh, my take on that region. I've been working in this area now really 30 years since I was a resident when I started dissecting the cavernous sinus. And over the last 25 years, I was lucky to have uh, great mentors who were pioneers around me and, uh, and by uh, moving to Arkansas, uh, where Dr. Almefti became the chairman and recruited Professor Yazogil, and then got introduced to great people that I'll mention in my lecture. And uh, this link to Arkansas is also present in all the panelists who you're going to listen to today. Um, it, um, they're all linked to hopefully the future of microneurosurgery in Arkansas as well. And uh, the way we're going to conduct this session is, is really for someone who is listening to this webinar and will have a good idea where to start and how to evolve in operating comfortably in the region of the cavernous sinus. So the first talk will be addressing the anatomy of the cavernous sinus. And then the second talk will be addressing how to evolve from anatomy to the clinical application and how to gradually build up your experience because you don't want to dive into a meningioma in the cavernous sinus once you finish the anatomy lesson. You have to build it up on different pathologies around that region that will prepare you to gradually become an expert in operating the more complex lesions there. And then uh, the other speakers will give cases which is an application to pathologies that you can start operating on, which will be less complex. And then another more complexity and to see how they have encountered some of the difficulties. And by this buildup, then we'll come to discuss how once you feel comfortable, you can apply all this knowledge at the same time. So the panelists we have today, they are, I know them personally, and I know them professionally, and I know their capabilities. And they are really, uh, among others, they are the seeds of the future of microneurosurgery, as well as the future of microneurosurgery in the cavernous sinus. They are the ones who are doing it the right way, which means to master the basics and build up your experience and commit to it over your lifetime and not just assume that this is a process when you learn it once and you start applying it at its highest level of complexity immediately. And that's how this should, approach, should be approached. But at the same time, this is also really how, micro, how neurosurgery in general should be approached. I remember when I finished residency, I don't think I was prepared to do a lot of things and looking back at it. But at the same time, you want to commit to be able to do all the things that you did not feel comfortable or competent in. So the first speaker is uh, Dr. Vicente Killis. Vicente is uh, from Spain and uh, Vicente has been a fellow with uh, Professor de Oliveira in Sao Paulo, and then he visited with us here in Little Rock, and he is considered one of the big family in Little Rock. And uh, Vicente is in Valencia at the institution where the famous anatomist Cajal was there. So anatomy is part of the culture of the university and the place where he comes from. And he will uh, start our uh, webinar 
addressing the uh, anatomy of the cavernous sinus and how to look at it to understand it. Thank you for being with us, Vicente. Thank you. I'm gonna start sharing my, my screen. Can you please allow me to, to share the screen? Yeah, I think, did you just click it at the bottom? Should work now. No, no, it's working. Okay, thank you. Yeah, okay. we can see it. Good. It's working. Okay. So, good morning, good, good afternoon from, from Spain. Thank you, Professor, for having me here. It's uh, an honor to be part of your webinar about uh, microsurgery of cavernous sinus. And we are going to, discuss, to start discussing about uh, the anatomy we need to master to start doing surgery at this region. I would like to start uh, giving some credit to my mentor and our friend, Professor Evandro de Oliveira, who shared uh, his love and passion for this amazing region called the uh, uh, cavernous sinus. We will discuss later on about the, the approaches and how to manage all the brain and neuro, neurovascular structures to approach and get access to the cavernous sinus. We all know that cavernous sinus is located almost in the center of the skull base related to the anterior, middle fossa, posterior fossa, cellar, and paracellar region. So we, we have to know how to identify la landmarks during surgery and how to get access to the different surface of the cavernous sinus. And we have to start from the bone. We have to, to, to understand the different uh, structures, the landmass we have during, during surgery and how to manage all these structures. This is uh, an upper view, uh, a little bit lateral to follow structures that we, we use during surgery. This is a lesser sphenoid wing. So, so we have anteriorly the anterior fossa, posteriorly middle fossa, and we can follow the lesser sphenoid wing until the anterior clinoid process. We know this is the lateral attachment of the anterior clinoid process. We have a medial attachment as the roof of the optic canal we have here and in the other side. And then we have a third attachment as the optic strap. And once we remove all these three attachments, we can free the anterior clinoid process as we will see later on. So medially, the optic canal, laterally, superior orbital fissure, posteriorly, foramen rotundum, second division will cross this uh, foramen, posteriorly, foramen ovale. Sometimes we can find more foramen, like this Vesalius foramen, that communicates the channels, the venous channels of the cavernous sinus with the extracranial venous uh, drainage. And posteriorly, the petrous bone, the posterior part of middle, middle fossa, the petrous ridge, some uh, grooves, some uh, landmass we can identify in the surface. Where we will see how the superior petrosal sinus will run here at the posterior limit, the petroclival region, immediately the clivus, posterior clinoid process, the body of the sphenoid bone, the cellar region, and the groove where the internal carotid artery will run through the petrous bone and then become the cavernous carotid artery to finally get access to the intracranial compartment after the clinoidal Segment. So we have to master all these bony structures from all point of view, from above, from lateral, from interior, from a surgical point of view, and get access to the landmarks to guide our surgery from the beginning to the depth of the, the skull base. 
This is a, a dissection of a skull. This is an orbitozygomatic approach, but, but we were going to focus a little bit and show you uh, almost a surgical point of view of middle fossa. And what we will see is the approach we are going to use mostly to, to access the, the cavernous sinus. This is a so-called pretemporal approach. Dr. Chris will discuss and show you later on. But we would like to get access to the floor of middle fossa, anterior part of middle fossa, lateral wall of the orbit. We will see how to expose and open the superior orbital fissure and remove part of the posterior third of the roof of the orbit as the roof of the orbit, uh, optic canal, and then expose the anterior clinoid process from a lateral point of view and then get access, uh, huge access to the middle fossa and posteriorly at the end to the posterior fossa. And where is the cavernous sinus? Cavernous sinus is just in there covered by dura, filled by uh, neurovascular structures that we are going to dissect step by step and get different uh, approaches to deal with different pathologies in the cavernous sinus, around the cavernous sinus, or through the cavernous sinus to the posterior fossa, posterior circulation, or brain stem. So now we are going to, to tell you how to, to approach different surface of the cavernous sinus, mainly the upper surface, the roof of the cavernous sinus, and the lateral wall, that we will see how to step by step dissecting all structures, we will get access to the middle surface and posterior wall of cavernous sinus and totally dissect the middle fossa and cavernous sinus. This is a little bit lateral point of view where we are going to start talking about the roof of cavernous sinus. We divide the roof in an anterior part where we find the anterior clinoid process covered by dura and a posterior part as the oculomotor triangle. So if we want to expose the anterior clinoid process, we are going to remove the dura from the lesser sphenoid wing and medial to the, the optic canal and optic nerve, and then expose the anterior clinoid process, the lesser sphenoid wing, the roof of the optic canal, and until the medial part. So if we drill, all this bone, we are going to open and expose the superior orbital fissure. We are going to open and expose the optic canal and the optic nerve covered by the falciform ligament. And we are going to get access to the optic strut. So we will be able to drill the third attachment of the anterior clinoid process and then free the anterior clinoid process and expose the uh, the last layer before opening the cavernous sinus from the anterior part of its roof. So here we find still a thin layer it is the so-called carotid oculomotor membrane and we are used to open this membrane parallel to the third nerve and then once we open the carotid oculomotor membrane we get access to the anterior compartments of the cavernous uh, sinus, we, we will have some bleeding from the cavernous sinus, and we can clean this membrane, remove the blood, and get access to the clinoidal segment. So now we have proximal control by dealing with paraclinoid aneurysm, and we have uh, exposure of the proximal and mainly the distal dural ring all around the internal carotid artery. So if we want to expose the, the clinoidal segment and expose our paraclinoid uh, uh, aneurysms, we have to remove the distal dural ring. So we have we, we free the, this clinoidal and ophthalmic uh, segments of the internal carotid artery. And now we are able to deal with paraclinoid aneurysms safely with a proximal control and an optimal exposure of the neck. So this is the dissection of the anterior part of the roof. We can proceed posteriorly. We can free the third uh, 
in cranial nerve, the coulomotor uh, nerve. We can open through here. Now we can free the nerve. We can dissect all along the, the roof of the cranial sinus, the nerve, and then be able to mobilize it medially or laterally if necessary. We can move a little bit more posterior and remove the dura to expose the posterior clinoid process, and then remove the posterior clinoid process and totally open the roof of the cavernous sinus. We can see here how we are going to get more bleeding from these posterior compartments. And if we remove this blood, we are going to expose the horizontal segment, the sending segment, and some main branches of the cavernous carotid artery as the meningo hypophyseal arteries, the posterior inferior hypophyseal uh, arteries. And now we can see how the posterior wall of cavernous sinus is projecting to the posterior fossa. The lateral wall will, will be related to the middle fossa. And now we start to visualize the middle wall of cavernous sinus just parallel to the horizontal segment of the cavernous carotid artery. We are going to focus a little bit and then mobilize the, the artery laterally and see another branch of the horizontal segment. This is the so-called McConnell uh, capsular artery. And if we move zoom in a little bit and get a lateral view, we can see how thin is this layer, this middle wall of cavernous sinus, how we can even visualize the pituitary glands through the, this thin layer and how it's crossed by uh, channels of venous channels from the cellar region and some branches from the horizontal segment of the cavernous carotid artery. So now we dissect the roof, we visualize the middle wall, we, uh, we understand how pituitary tumors can get in the cavernous sinus and proceed embedding all this region. And now we can see how the roof is totally dissected and we are going to start peeling the middle fossa to identify, exactly identify all cranial nerves running through the lateral wall and all the bony structures of the middle fossa. So we will show you how to peel the dura of middle fossa starting close to the anterior clinoid process. And once you peel all this dura, you start to visualize some neurovascular structure. This is a pure lateral view of the cavernous sinus and part of middle fossa. We already dissect the roof of cavernous sinus. We see here the optic nerve, the ophthalmic artery running below through the optic canal, the clinoidal segment, part of the distal dural ring is still attached to the, to the carotid artery. Horizontal segment, we see here the third nerve entering through the oculomotor triangle, four nerves, both will run almost together until the superior orbital fissure. And through this periosteal layer, we see the Gasserian ganglion, V1, first division of fifth nerve, V2, second division, and V3. So V1 will be running together with the third and fourth cranial nerve until the superior orbital fissure. And if we identify fourth and first division, we can open the window between both and expose the horizontal segment of the cavernous carotid artery to get proximal control if necessary and identify here another branch, the ferrolateral trunk of the cavernous carotid artery. Between V1 and V2, we can open here another window and inject fibrin root to get uh, control of bleeding from the interior compartments of the cavernous uh, sinus and see, even see here distal uh, part of this inferolateral trunk running to the foramen rotundo. Second division, third division, foramen ovale, and posteriorly we see, we can imagine here the gasserian ganglion deep inside the metal scape, so we can open here a window during surgery, we can even open a bigger window and release CSF from posterior fossa to relax the brain 
and then be able to proceed posteriorly peeling the middle fossa and lateral wall of cavernous sinus to reach the upper part of posterior fossa and posterior circulation. We come back to an upper view once we dissect the lateral surface of the, the cavernous sinus just to see how the third nerve is running a little bit medially, fourth nerve and first division are in close relation at this level and running until the superior orbital fissure. And if we focus a little bit and retract laterally the first division, B1 and fourth nerve, we can see how sixth nerve is running deep inside the cavernous sinus coming from the systems of posterior fossa, the Rallos canal, through the posterior wall of cavernous sinus, running lateral to the ascending segment, inferior to the inferior lateral trunk, and medial to, to V1 to the first division of the fifth nerve. So now we already dissect the roof, and we identify all neurovascular structures, the lateral wall, middle fossa, and we are going to focus a little bit on the posterior part of middle fossa and middle segment, middle, middle compartment of the petrous bone, just to identify more neurovascular structures. This is the GSPN running from the geniculate ganglion that you can see here. So we know that the facial nerve will be running around the semicircular canals that we will find posteriorly related to the arcuate eminence. We see here a thin layer of bone covering the roof of the middle ear. So we have to be careful here to not open the middle ear. And we see here a muscle parallel to the GSPN. This is the tensor tympani muscle. And we will find here a tendon crossing the middle ear attached to the tympan. Anteriorly, the foramen espinosum and middle meningeal artery. And, anterior, and a little bit more anterior, foramen ovale and third division of fifth nerve. So once we identify GSPN, we know and the, the muscle, we, we know how the petrous carotid artery is running through the petrous bone and that will run below the gasserian ganglion, ganglion to become the a pure uh, cavernous carotid artery. If the geniculate ganglion is here, and now we, are, we zoom out to identify the nerves in the posterior fossa, seven and eight, and Ica looping close to the internal acoustic meatus, we can imagine how the nerves are running deep inside the petrous bone, so we can drill and identify the dura of the internal acoustic meatus geniculate uh, ganglion. So in this corner, we will find the semicircular canal. So the arcuate eminence is located here. And medially, we know that the apex of the, the petrous bone can be removed, can be uh, drilled to open a window as a, an anterior petrosectomy to approach pathology located in the posterior fossa. We have to be careful in this corner between GSPN, geniculate ganglion, and internal acoustic meatus, where the cochlea will be located, I will show you later on. This is a lateral view, same structures, the dura, internal acoustic canal, geniculate ganglion, GSPN, petrous carotid artery, the tensor tympani muscle, and once we open the dura, we can identify seven and eight nerves. And if we drill the bone and we can even continue drilling below the posterior root of fifth nerve, we can get access to the posterior fossa, upper third of posterior fossa petroclival uh, junction, and even get transmechal scape approaches. We come back to this posterior view to compare with another dissection just to show you where the cochlea and the semicircular canals are located. Seven and eight, ICA looping in the, close to the internal acoustic meatus, and we follow the nerves, the cochlear nerve, the cochlea is here, just in this corner, I told you, between GSPN, genuclear ganglion, and fascial nerve. The fascial nerve will run below the lateral semicircular canal, and we see here the nerve 
through the mastoid bone, all semicircular canal and the superior one projecting as the earthquake eminence. And laterally, I told you, the tegment tympani, this thin layer of bone lateral to the earthquake eminence can open and get access to the middle ear. So we have to be careful while drilling at this level. This is the tendon of the tensor tympan, tympani muscle. And we can see here the disc of the tympan. So now we zoom out again. We already dissect the middle fossa, the lateral wall, part of the petrous bone and, and apex of the petrous bone, the roof of cavernous sinus. And we are going to focus on the posterior wall and six uh, nerve. And if we remove the dura, we can see how the six nerve is running through the Dorellos canal below the petro clival ligament and then run laterally to the ascending segment of cavernous carotid artery. And now we see here the main branches of cavernous carotid artery as the meningo hypophyseal trunk, posteriorly running the tentorial artery, Bernasconi casinari artery, medially inferior hypophyseal arteries, and sometimes coming from the same trunk or different trunks, we see here the dorsal meningeal artery feeding the dura of the upper part of the clivus. We are going to retract the cranial nerves again to show you the root of six nerve from the systems of posterior, posterior fossa through the cavernous sinus and finally through the superior orbital fissure to get access to the, the orbit. And if we focus a little bit more, we can see all cranial nerves or branches of internal uh, uh, cavernous carotid artery, dorsal meningeal artery, meningo hypophyseal artery, tentorial artery, McConnell's capsular artery, the inferior lateral trunk related to this sixth nerve and how the sixth nerve is located medial to the to B1 medial to the first division. We are missing here still one landmark that we can ident identify during surgery. As this, and this is the uh, petrolingual ligament as the limit of the petrous carotid artery and the cavernous carotid artery. We are going to change our point of view. And now we see here this ligament coming from the petrous apex to the lingual process of the body of the sphenoid bone as the limit, the proximal limit of cavernous carotid artery ascending segment. We see here six nerve running laterally and then running anteriorly through the superior orbital pressure. And to finish, we are going to come back to the bone. This is the, the approach we are going to perform usually to deal with uh, pathology in, around, and through the cavernous sinus. But now we have all landmarks. We know the anatomy of the bone that we need to master. And we can put all the puzzle together and see how through this pretemporal approach and the knowledge of the anatomy of cavernous sinus, we are going to be able to treat pathology close to the anterior fossa, cellular region, paracellular region, and cavernous sinus, middle fossa, lateral wall of cavernous sinus, anterior petrosal approaches, transmechal scape approaches, transcavernous approaches to the posterior fossa, posterior circulation, or even the, the brain stem. Once again, thank you, Professor, for this opportunity, and I hope to see you soon in the lab in Little Rock. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vicente. As usual, a great uh, way of uh, superimposing the anatomy over uh, the uh, bony anatomy and layers, which really clarifies the, the way the uh, in-depth understanding of that region should be. The next speaker is uh, Dr. Samford Chu. Uh, Samford is a uh, professor of neurosurgery at the uh, Veterans uh, um, uh, Administration Hospital in Taiwan, Taipei. I have known him for 
uh, getting close to 15 years now or more and veteran and um, he he is the head of the cerebrovascular and skull base program there and uh, a lot of you may have heard him already in different meetings and Samford has really done it the right way uh, he went to the basics starting with anatomy and evolved to an outstanding surgeon and he uh, he has a, a great talk that one time he gave us about how to evolve into operating on complex lesions in the cavernous sinus. So I asked him to uh, re-present this concept and uh, this will be very helpful for those who uh, always pose the question for me, well, when do you think I'll be ready? How long does it take to be ready? It's not only the time, but what you do during this time and evolve into it. So uh, Samford, you can go ahead, please. Thank you, Dr. Krisht. Uh, so can you see the uh, screen now? Yes. Okay, I would like to thank Dr. Krisht again. Uh, it's also my uh, honor and pleasure, especially to see all my old friends. Although there is the COVID-19 pandemics and I'm staying in Taipei, but my heart is in Little Rock. And today, uh, as requested by Dr. Krisht, I would like to talk about the uh, uh, application, clinical application of cavernous sinus approach. And I'm from Taipei Veterans General Hospital in Taipei. And I was the fellow uh, with Dr. Chris since uh, 2007 to 2009. And I was lucky uh, when I stayed in Little Rock, I had three great mentors like Professor Yashakil, Professor Marti, and Dr. Chris. And today, as um, I would like to uh, share my uh, concepts from uh, the basics to the clinical. And as uh, Vicente is showing the anatomy, everyone has known that uh, the cavernous sinus anatomy is complex. But how can you uh, turn the anatomy into the clinical applications, uh, especially uh, when you uh, have a good opportunity to stay in the lab? You have to be familiar with the anatomy, but also you have to go to the OR to watch your uh, mentor's surgery. This is the key uh, steps where you can jump from the lab to the operating theater. So when I back to the Taipei, I, I follow the Dr. Chris principle. I learned a lot of uh, concept from him. So I, uh, when I back in Taipei, I summarized, the, summarized some concepts of the Kevin Sinus uh, surgery and technique based on the uh, anatomy. So as you know, and as uh, Vicente has introduced, the cavernous sinus anatomy, uh, you can uh, uh, familiar with the dura, uh, the dura structures, the bony structure, the venous channels, and neurovascular structures. So each uh, anatomy actually has, uh, has this uh, very important role. Uh, usually when you're doing the surgery, you have to identify the landmark, like the uh, maybe the Dorino canal. You have to identify the pectoral uh, sphenoid ligament, or if you uh, want to identify the uh, outer ring and the inner ring, because you know the below the ring, maybe the, the oculomotor nerve or the orthomeal artery pass through. Although the anatomy is complex, but uh, I learned from Dr. Krish the concept of unlocking. Why we said the unlocking? Because each nerve and each vessels, when they're piercing through the dura from the uh, cavernous sinus into the dura, each vessels and nerve, they are anchors to the dura. So when you do in the surgery in or around the cavernous sinus, the most key steps, you have to free 
reach the nerve and the blood vessels. Otherwise, when you try to open the window, widen the, the windows, you will get all these important structure injury. So the most important concept when you're dealing with the cavern of sinus is try to free each nerves and vessels. And when you start the, the uh, cavern of sinus surgery, and based on the anatomy, you can study the basics of the cavern of sinus surgery. So like this slide shows, you can see the black blocks. This is the basic techniques you have to learn. First, you have to know how to peeling off the cavern of sinus lead wall then you know you have to know how to do the anterior clinodectomy, and you have to know how to remove the outer dura ring. When you're familiar with these basic techniques, then you can advance based on your, your experience. You can do more, like you can do the transmacral cave approach. You can go deep within the cabinet sinus, or you can add more, like a building blocks. You can do the uh, petrocetomy, or you can divide in the tentorium to widen the whole area surrounding the cavernous sinus. So based on the different approach and different pathologies, um, I summarize uh, several pathologies or tumors in or the surrounding the cavernous sinus. And maybe you can follow this flow chart when you're dealing with some of the pathology, you maybe think about how different parts of the anatomy are involved and how different parts of the anatomy you have to deal with. So when I back to Taipei, I are uh, starting to do the cavernous sinus. In the past years, I know the learning curve in my career. So when I started the cavernous sinus surgery, I uh, tried to do the simple ones like a pecan, orthomy aneurysms, and also the tuberculin cell meningioma, the sphenoid rich meningioma. When I get in, gathering my uh, experience and I uh, dare to deal with the clinodome meningioma and more complex paraclinal aneurysm like a ventral type or medial type paraclinal aneurysm, then the cranial pharyngioma or the uh, simple types or shown number like a type A or D. And getting more experience I tried to do the uh, uh, double uh, dum dumbbell shape, the trigeminal schwannoma, and invasive macro uh, pituitary macroadenoma or basal apex aneurysms. Then the most difficult for me is level four, is uh, like a petroclavial meningioma or the cavernous sinus meningioma. So different level, you have to familiar with different uh, uh, techniques to dealing with different uh, pathologies. So uh, like uh, this uh, basic approach, uh, if you are at a level one or two, uh, you, you have to familiar with the, this basic approach. This basic approach actually is the aim to the pathology in cellular and the supracellular region or the paraclinal region. So this is, uh, is for example, this is a simple case. This is a spinal rich meningioma at the level one. The only technique you need to learn is the dura peeling. So if you know how to peel in the dura, and actually why you have to do the extra dura peeling for a spinal rich meningioma, because at the beginning, you already devascularize the tumor and you already uh, uh, detach the base of the tumor to facilitate the Simpson grade one a tumor remo removal. So if you are uh, familiar with this technique, at the beginning already uh, uh, remove the, the tumor at the base of the dura. So the tumor removal will become very simple uh, because the base is already detached. So you just circumcise the tumor and you achieve the Simpson gray one and uh, tumor re removal. So this is the simple case for spherorich meningioma. If you do more, a little bit more complex, then you have to deal with the, like a uh, tuberculin cell meningioma. Uh, in addition to dura peeling, you know, you have to know how to do the anterior clinodectomy, and you have to know how to cut the phospholipman and outer ring. And also the open and sylvian is the basic technique. 
And this picture show why you have to do the uh, anterior clinotectomy because if you remove the ACP, then you get the, the space to deal with the ring and the phospholignin. Why we have to uh, remove the outer ring and phospholignin? As I said, we remove the ring and phospholignin because we want to release the uh, carotid artery and the, the most important is the opti nerve. Like this picture showed, the arrowhead showed uh, some indentation overlying the opti nerve. If you don't remove the phospholignin, then you uh, try to remove the tumor, you pull, you pull a little bit, you, pull, you push hard on the opti nerve, so you get the opti nerve injured. So this is very important. At the beginning, you have to release the, the opti nerve from the phospholignin. You have to release the carotis from the outer ring. So this is the basic technique to do to free all these structures. Then you widen the windows uh, and when you pull over the opti nerve, you widen the window and you get easier to remove the tumor. Another case is the PCOM. Uh, most, I think most of the people that do intradural approach to do the PCOM and clipping. But for me, uh, when I back to, uh, from Little Rock, I try to do the same steps as Dr. Krish. And I realized how beauty of the uh, window and trajectory to the PCOM. So it's the same techniques. You remove the, uh, you do the dural peeling, you remove the anterior clinoids, you remove the uh, outer ring so that you can uh, mobilize the carotids through this window and this trajectory. And actually uh, you can see the aneurysm very well. And also the takeoff of the pecan is very clear so that you put the first clip or the pilot clip, you won't catch the pecan. So this trajectory is the best than the uh, intradural approach. And this is uh, also the, the level one technique. So through this CDA, this is the trajectory directly to the lateral aspect of carotis, whereas the pecan take off. So it's easier if you do have got such a window to uh, directly visualize the pecan and the aneurysm. Now, I moved to the uh, uh, orthomia artery aneurysm because it's a little bit similar to the pecan. Also, the, uh, you need to know the techniques is dura peeling, anterior clonodectomy, and those auto ring removal. So if you remove the ACP, you expose the paraclinal space, then you have to uh, remove the ring to release the carotis and the aneurysm. And also you have to release the, uh, sometimes you have released the ophthalmic artery, then you can put your clip. But if you don't remove the ring very well, if you put a clip, then the ring will become something like a string. They will also like a percy fat. They will strangulate the carotid. So for such a case, even if it's a simple ophthalmic uh, uh, aneurysm, you have to familiar with, and you have to do the good, better job to totally remove the dorsal as better artery. So when you are a good uh, experience in level one, like you play the uh, video games, you are uh, now you are entered the next level. You have to be equipped with the new techniques. So at the level two, maybe you have to deal with the, some complex paraclinal aneurysm. So you have to do extended dura peeling, not only one anterior one third uh, is for the level one, but maybe the half up to the uh, V2, uh, you have to, or maybe half the microscape, you have to do the more extended dura peeling. Then the same, you do the anterior clinotectomy, you have to know how to remove the outer ring. But at this level, you have to know the real anatomy of the outer ring because medially the outer ring is attached to the optic strut. So you have to cut the outer ring all the way and detach it from the optic strut because when you deal with the medial type of the aneurysm, 
you have to detach the outer ring from the oblique strut because, because sometimes you have to put the uh, fenestrated clips. If you don't remove the medial aspect of the uh, dura ring, you cannot advance your clips into the uh, uh, carotid cave space. And also uh, the outer ring, laterally the outer ring are fused with the uh, uh, so-called inner membrane or the oculomental membrane. So when you're dealing with some of the inferior aspect of the uh, paraglinal aneurysm, you have to cut the outer ring down to the uh, ventral, type, ventral aspect of the carotid. So you have to, to uh, release the outer ring uh, from the oculomental membrane so that you can mobilize more of the karate to see these ventral aspect of the, the, the space. So like this picture set show, this is the inferior type of the aneurysm. And you can see the outer ring overlying the aneurysm and uh, later it uh, actually uh, infused with the inner membrane. So you have to free the outer ring from the inner membrane so that you can free the aneurysm. And if you free from the inner membrane, then you get the uh, distal and proximal uh, neck of the aneurysm. So you can put, put a clip in. Actually, this picture just shows a single step. Uh, in real surgery, I try to uh, put a release and put the clips, try to remove more of the, the tissue and to make the, uh, the, uh, the neck clean. Uh, I don't because I don't want to cause the uh, sling defects, and actually, uh, and I want to catch the whole neck of the aneurysm. I just show this picture just show the the important steps of the this technique. For well, this case, is the medial type of the paracline aneurysms. If you don't uh, remove the outer ring from the optic strut, like I said, you cannot push, you cannot advance your clip more advanced into the carotid cave space. So you have to remove their outer ring from the medial aspect of the carotid, then you can put this clip more advanced and catch the whole neck of the aneurysm. And like Vicente uh, said, uh, for some, sometimes if the uh, carotid artery the aneurysm is large or complex, then you have to uh, always keep in mind, you have to prepare the proximal control uh, like in the Parkinson triangle because most of the people always ask the questions about how do you do the proximal control for the uh, paraclinal aneurysm? If you are familiar with the cavernous surgery, you know the best way to, to put the proximal control is within the Parkinson triangle sometimes. So like this case, it's a complex uh, pecan aneurysm. And when I exposed the aneurysm, I realized the proximal control is uh, impossible because the severe calcification in the proximal end of the carotid. So I have to find the proximal control. So I opened the uh, Parkinson triangle and I exposed the carotid within the Parkinson triangle. So now I have the proximal occlusion then I will attack the, the aneurysm. So in this case, I, I put the uh, proximal control in proximal karate and this control in the A1. Then I put the uh, fenestration straight clip to shaping the uh, pecan. And because the aneurysm is complex, I shape in the lumen of the pecan. Then I put another uh, fenestration clips to shaping the aneurysm. So like, like you see from the picture, and this is the final clipping. And also, uh, if you are familiar with the, uh, all these techniques, then you can do the, uh, some pathology like a cranial fangioma. Um, it's, the technique is, is almost the same. Extended dura peeling and dectomy and remove the phospholipid outer ring to release the optic nerve and carotid artery. Because as you know, all these pathologies, they push the uh, optic nerve and carotid. So you have to remove the, uh, all these dural structures to widen the uh, windows 
and to lessen the damage to all these important structures. And why you do the extended dura peeling? Because usually the uh, craniopharyngeoma is extended supra uh, uh, cellar uh, high up in the third ventricle. So you have to do more dura peeling so that you have good trajectory of ground below. So uh, this is the picture shows when you do the uh, uh, anterior colonotectomy and remove all the ring structures. Actually, you have a very nice view to the cella and the supracella window, like a Bose optiner, and you can see the pituitary stalk. And another case, when you widen the space, you can even see the pituitary stalk on the opposite side of the carotid artery. So this approach provides a very good view and also the adequate uh, windows to the uh, cell line and the supracellar space. Also the plinodal meningioma, the techniques only you have to be equipment is almost the same. Extend the dura peeling anterior plinotectomy, remove the ligament, the other ring and open the sylvan fissure. So as you see, at the level of one and the level two, if you have the same technique, you can deal in a lot of the pathology in cella and the supracellar space. Now you, you are equipped with good techniques. Now you can uh, enter the next level. You can open the microscope and actually you are preparing to enter the uh, cavernous sinus because the, uh, you open the microscope is the first step to totally open the cavernous sinus. So usually we're using these techniques to deal with the trigeminal schwannoma like type A and type D uh, because it's uh, 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 superficial. So you do the more extended dura pulling and open the microscope is very simple because the, the roof overlying the microscope is thin. And if you want to widen the microscope, then you have to, to open the temporal base dura and dividing the tentorium to widen the, the space to the microscope. So like this picture show, when you do the dura peeling, you expose the uh, microscope and also the tumor, and you do the tumor debulking, then you can totally remove the tumor purely extradural way, in an extradural way. Then if you open the, uh, widen the uh, microscope and do the transcontrolling approach, actually you allow the, uh, the space to the, uh, into pedunculo fossa. So combined with the, uh, the level one, level two approach, if you do the transmicroscape and transtentorian approach, you can deal with the pathology in supercella, cella, and into pedunculo fossa. So when you open the uh, microscope, you cut the tentorium, you follow the trigeminal nerve, you can reach to the entry zone of the trigeminal nerve. So actually you totally open the uh, space to the uh, prepounding pre space and the uh, interpeduncular fossa. So using these same techniques, you fully expose your layer wall, the cavernous sinus, you open the uh, microscope, you cut the tendorium based dura and fully dividing the tentorium you can do the passage like a uh, dumbbell type of trigeminal schwannoma like this case. You open the Mexico cave, remove the tumor, and uh, release the, some rootlets of the trigeminal nerve. You cut the tentorium to widen the Mexico cave. Then you can reach almost to the, is the trigeminal nerve, the, the entry zone. So, also, if you uh, can reach to the interpeduncular fossa, then you can deal in with the basilar apex aneurysm. The new techniques you have to learn is you have to open the oculomotor window to mobilize the oculomotor nerve because you need the, the proximal control. And also you have to remove the posterior clinal process. It's the same reason you have to get more space for, for your plasma control. 
So like this case, uh, you have to uh, free the third nerve from the uh, automotor window so that you can mobilize the third nerve to widen the space between the carotid and the oculomotor nerve to see the basilar to see the basilar artery. So you have to remove remove the PCP because usually the PCP is in the way for your proximal control. You, you remove the PCP, then you have very uh, widened space to put a temporary clip. If you have the good proximal controls, you have a confidence to deal with the basal FS aneurysm. So this is the basic uh, uh, key the techniques for dealing with the best apex aneurysm. And also, uh, like I said, if you are familiar with the macroscape, familiar with all the structures surrounding the uh, cella and the supercella, now you are uh, qualified to enter the uh, cavern of science to dealing the pathology like invasive macroadenoma. So you're using the similar techniques, dura peeling, anterior clandidectomy, and remove the phosphor liquid outer ring to release the opti nerve and the carotis to open the oculomotor nerve to release the oculomotor nerve. And sometimes you have to open the sylvan and you open the maxillary cave and divide in the tentorium because sometimes the the uh, pituitary uh, the macroadenoma we extending. Uh, into uh, below the uh, uncus and parahippocampal gyrus. Then you enter the different windows sort of between the, the nerves. Like the, this case or this case. At the beginning, usually uh, uh, the ACP uh, already have been uh, eroded by the tumor. So it's very easy to remove the ACP. Then you can expose the, uh, the carotis and sometimes when you do the dura peeling, the tumor is coming off because of the pressure. So we remove the ACP, identify the carotis, and usually I will open the uh, oculomotor membrane and remove the tumor uh, below the third nerve. And I open the Parkinson triangle to remove the tumor between the third and fourth nerve. And when you remove more of the tumor, then you have to uh, identify the sixth nerve. Usually you elevate the fourth nerve and V1, and you can trace the carotis to the, uh, like the Vicente mentioned, the inferior little trunk. Usually the sixth nerve is between the inferior little trunk and the carotid. Then you can remove the tumors within each windows between the nerves, like a, window between the V1 and the V2 and you expose the carotis. And also you back to the supracellular uh, region, you like you using the similar techniques, like we mentioned uh, level one and level two, you open the dura ring and you uh, open the phosphor limon to mobilize the opti nerve and the carotis to remove the tumor extending into the supracellular. So after the surgery, you can see the tumor or within each corner to make sure the tumor within each corner is uh, removed. And also the, if you are familiar with all these uh, structure in and the surrounding the cavernous sinus, now you can move to the uh, posterior fossa. To open the po posterior fossa, like uh, Vicente mentioned, you have to do the anterior pectocetomy, and you have to cut all the way the tentorium to expose the, the infra and supra and the infra and supra tentorium space to communicate in both space and communicating the uh, supracella, the cella in the pitangular fossa, preponding space down to the posterior fossa. So at this level, the most difficult one is the petroclifal meningioma because this tumor usually are serious medial to the internal uh, auditory meatus and the posterior gastric ganglion, like uh, uh, recently showing the IIC, the 7-8 nerve uh, relation to the trigeminal nerve. 
And usually large basal client mangioma occupies the supercella in the peduncular fossa, peponin space, and lower clival regions. So to deal with the large petroclival meningioma, you have the, all the techniques involving the level one, level two, level three, and even the level four techniques. So when you try to totally open the space in the surrounding the cavernous sinus, they, they you have to consider three obstacles to your view. The first one is the anterior clinal process because these obstacles is in the way to the cell line and supercellular region. And the tentorial and posterior clinal process is in the way to the peduncular fossa and the prepumping space. So this is why we usually open the microscope dividing the tentorium so we can get access to the interpetumbical fossa and the preponding space. Then we remove the anterior patches to get the space to, into the uh, posterior fossa. So this cartoon shows the three trajectory and three obstacles to the whole space surrounding the cavernous sinus. So for the petrochlebo meningioma, we have to fully uh, expose the little world of cavernous sinus, do all the techniques you have, have done in previous levels, anterior clinotectomy, anterior petrocetomy, opening the silver fissure. And you have to divide all the dura structure like the forceful ligament, outer ring to release the optinary carotid. And you have to open the oculomotor window to release the oculomotor nerve you have to remove the posterior clinal process and opening the microscope to free the trigeminal. Then you divide in the tendorium, try to localize the force nerve and free the force nerve. Then you open the posterior fossa dura to remove the tumors. Then sometimes the tumor invading the cavernous sinus and using the similar techniques to enter different windows of the cavernous sinus. And the most important one is decompression of the renal canals. Like this case, this is a complex petroclival meningioma. So at the beginning, you fully expose the cavernous sinus, you remove the ACP, and you turn the, your microscope to do the anterior petrus and preserve the GSPN. So at the beginning, you have to do the, all the uh, uh, extradural the exposure. Then you, have, then you go into the intradural and you remove the uh, phosphor lemon or the ring to free the optic nerve and the carotid. Then you turn to the oculomotor nerve. You free the oculomotor nerve from the oculomotor uh, membrane and you identify the force nerve outside the dura. Then you turn back to microscope. You open the microscope and you remove the tumor, release the trigeminal nerve roots, and you cut the tentorium to widen the microscope. Then you divide in the tentorium and you localize the force nerve intra intradural part of the force nerve. And you remove the uh, tentorium to open the space to the interpeduncular and prepumping space. Then you can either uh, follow the trigeminal or you can do the uh, tumor within the cavernous yeah, sinus. A couple of minutes, okay. Thank yeah. you. Then you uh, open the uh, Parkinson to identify the sixth nerve and decompress the dorinal canals. So this is the some most key steps to dealing with the uh, petroclave manager. So um, I think I'm finished with my uh, um, talk because I would like to just give some general uh, introduction to application, how you are uh, based on the anatomy of the chemical sinus and how do you apply all this anatomy into your clinical works. And I would like to thank Dr. Christian again to involve me uh, and have me back to Little Rock School. And Actually, uh, I follow Dr. Chris' steps. I'm making uh, friends of his best friends and also learn from his friends. So I was very lucky. I learned from a lot of uh, surgical techniques and concepts 
not only from Dr. Krish, but also his friends like Professor Evandro, like Professor Dolang. And we actually with the big families and in Little Rock. And I remember uh, the first time I was invited to Professor Yora's lab surgery. I was so nervous and Dr. Krish encouraged me and he said, he said, welcome to my world. And actually, um, he led me not only to the uh, the microsurgery world, but on but also uh, to the you know to maybe you can ask me how I feel now today, because I'm following all these great mentors. Now I feel like a eagle that's soaring high in the sky. So this is not only the uh, microsurgical world; it's the freedom. You will feel free when you're familiar with all these um, concepts and techniques. And like you doing your surgery, you feel free when you do everything like you as at will. So mm -hmm. thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Sam. For, that was a great uh, uh, kind of a gradation of how to evolve with your surgeries. And it shows in, in your performance. The next speaker is uh, Dr. Keith Al-Mefti. Uh, Dr. Al-Mefti and I have a lot of things in common. We have similar faith. We had to live with Dr. Al-Mefti for a long time. And Keith now is, uh, is one of the uh, uh, upcoming professors at the Barrow Neurological Institute. And uh, he, he and I have been not only living with El Mefti, but we had to learn all the details and and uh, the privilege of being uh, his students as at one time or another. And uh, he's also one of those who has dedicated himself to this region uh, on for a long-term plan. And he will also give his perspective on it. And I ask him to present some cases um, and uh, how he approached this region. Keith? Thank you very much. Can you see my screen now, Dr. Krisht? Not yet. You'll have to click share screen at the very bottom. There we go. You got it. Okay. Thank you. So thank you to Dr. Krish and Dr. Abu. Dr. Krish asked me to show a, a case of a trigeminal schwannoma in the region uh, in line with uh, Dr. Sue's uh, uh, gradiated um, uh, approach to tackling lesions uh, in this region. Uh, you know, I think the, the question of this webinar is, well, how do you learn to operate in the cavernous sinus? And uh, I think it's there's two fundamental elements to it. First, uh, somebody teaches you to operate in the cavernous sinus. Uh, and these are some of the people that have taught me. And then second, you spend time in the laboratory. Uh, and, and hopefully you spend time in the laboratory in the operating room uh, with people that have mastered it before you. Uh, and you can learn from them. And a special thank you to Dr. Abood for uh, organizing this course and for all of his contributions to uh, laboratory and neurosurgery in the cavernous sinus. Uh, you know, I had the uh, pleasure as a, as a medical student that he took me into the cadaver lab for uh, a rotation and uh, spent time, uh, devoted his time to uh, teaching. Uh, so I'm going to present a, a Okay, so I think on uh, Sanford scale, so level two, and, and uh, it's a, a type A uh, schwannoma in a young woman that presented with uh, some V1 hypesthesia and, and anesthesia. Uh, and um, she was followed initially, her tumor presented growth. Um, and so we planned for um, a, a resection of the tumor. Uh, here you can see her tumor. Uh, it's uh, entirely in the uh, cavernous sinus in the middle cranial fossa. And I, I think uh, uh, these schwannomas really uh, ref 
uh, are a good entry point into the cavernous sinus for a couple reasons. Uh, first, they're, uh, they're soft tumors. Uh, you see my pointer? Uh, first, they're, they're soft tumors and they have a, a, a distinct plane with the uh, cranial nerves that they are, are not involving. And even the, the, V1, the, the trigeminal branch that they arise from, uh, they, they spare the remainder of, of, of that branch. So it'll be a single fibril that this tumor arises from and there'll be a plane of dissection with the remaining um, uh, branch. Uh, also, uh, where it pushes the other contents of the cavernous sinus uh, and, and if it pushes the contents. So the schwannomas typically uh, expand that space uh, and push the contents of the cavernous sinus away. So, uh, and most importantly, the carotid. Uh, and so while this seems like a tumor that um, uh, envelops the carotid, it's really just pushing the carotid uh, medially. And so you don't have to work beyond the carotid artery uh, and um, uh, the plane of dissection with the carotid artery uh, is very nice. Uh, whereas the cranial nerves, uh, with the exception of the sixth nerve, uh, is pushed laterally. Um, whereas a meningioma uh, uh, involving the cavernous sinus may encapsulate all of those structures and, and surround all of those structures, uh, the schwannomas uh, uh, exist within. Uh, so this is a, a woman's scans. Uh, we perform uh, uh, a frontal temporal approach. I, I, I like to cut the zygoma. Um, I think it, it gives you a, a, a flush um, uh, uh, dissection a, a, along the middle cranial fossa and it opens that space up a little bit. Uh, and then uh, as shown in the previous lectures, uh, uh, removing some of the uh, uh, orbital roof and lateral orbit uh, or wall uh, to uh, expose the periorbita and the meningeal orbital band. Uh, once there, um, uh, so here's the view, here's frontal lobe, uh, here's temporal lobe, uh, here will be the orbital roof, this will be the middle fossa floor on the left side of the screen. Uh, here you can see some uh, periorbita uh, coming into view. Uh, and then uh, uh, the meningeal orbital band will be here. Uh, so we'll begin the dissection. Um, here, looking at the frontal lobe, here's the meningeal orbital band, uh, which uh, we will cut. And now gain us access uh, into the space uh, in, into the correct dural layer. Uh, here's the anterior clinoid or the beginning of the clinoid. Uh, and we'll begin to peel that uh, uh, dural layer back. Uh, and as we do that, the tumor will uh, come into view very nicely. Um, now, one of the challenges I, I've had in these is the tumor, the nerves can be very difficult to see because the tumor uh, expands the nerves, uh, but usually the tumor will uh, uh, be eager to come out, and so it'll present itself uh, to you. And once you get a small amount uh, of debulking of that tumor, uh, the nerves are much more apparent. So here you can see the V1 branch, uh, and then we'll uh, begin to dissect the posterior wall. We'll open that cavernous sinus uh, just a little bit further posteriorly uh, to give us access to the posterior margin of the tumor. Uh, and then you can see just what's so favorable about these, tri uh, these trigeminal schwannomas uh, is that uh, they really have a nice plane with that cavernous sinus wall. Here's the sixth nerve uh, in the depth of the field. Uh, and then uh, we'll proceed with dissecting the margins uh, of the tumor. Some debulking may be useful. Uh, I try not to use the ultrasonic aspirator in the cavernous sinus, uh, but the additional space may be necessary. Um, uh, and then, uh, uh, as you can see, as this dissection proceeds, um, uh, really the, the tumor um, uh, brings itself to you uh, and the anatomy becomes more and more clear. So here's the uh, carotid in the depth uh, and you can see the, the tumor has a very nice plane of dissection uh, with the carotid artery. Uh, and uh, once we have that, uh, we're really, um, uh, the the danger portion of the procedure is beyond us uh, and we can uh, resect the remainder of this tumor. We'll identify, and this was to my uh, point about the 
uh, different fibers that the tumors are rising from. Um, you know, that we, we call this a V1 schwannoma, but it's really a, a schwannoma of one uh, fiber of V1. And, and here you can see uh, the bulk of V1 uh, in, the, in the proximal field. Uh, and then actually from the tumor, uh, you can see a single fiber uh, uh, of nerve presenting into uh, the schwannoma. Uh, and, and that's really the only fiber that needs to be sacrificed. So even the, the, the parent branch of V1 schwannoma, uh, you, can you can preserve the sensation in its distribution. Um, and then the remainder of the tumor uh, is removed uh, in a similar fashion. So the remainder of the, the wall of the cavernous sinus is removed. And uh, as you can see, you're, you're now, for the schwannomas, you have to work beyond the carotid artery. Uh, you don't, uh, the, the trigeminal branches are in your field. Uh, here's a final view of the uh, resection. Uh, in the carotid and the depth uh, of the field. You know, as you, as uh, Sanford pointed out, uh, it's kind of you progress along these lesions. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, I think the next level of lesion pushes the carotid towards you and you need to work beyond it. <clears throat> so final view of the resection uh, in this, uh, here V2 becomes very obvious uh, and the other portions of V1 are splayed out. Uh, to here and here. Uh, and the final view, entirely extradural procedure, uh, tolerated very well uh, by the patients. Uh, <clears throat> this patient did, did excellent. Uh, uh, we had a gro nice gross total resection of the tumor. Uh, she maintained her preoperative neurologic status uh, and um, uh, was is now stable at three years post-op. Um, so, uh, I think um, uh, Dr. Krish asked me to present uh, this as a as a, a stepping stone uh, in the uh, progression and the uh, in the progression and surgery of the region, uh, and uh, I think it sets a, a good example of a, a place to start uh, operating in in the air, in the cavernous sinus area. Uh, I think I'll turn it back over to Dr. Krish with that. Thank you. Thank you, Keith, and uh, for uh, showing the nice details of the anatomy. And that what, what Dr. Almefti mentioned is, is really important because understanding the pathology uh, guides you to the resection, like you have seen. In this case, staying within the uh, tumor itself, because you know that the different anatomic structures are pushed away from it. There are different types which extend more posteriorly into the posterior fossa that I will allude to in, in the lecture afterward. Along the same line, I ask Dr. Sheshwat uh, Mizra, and Sheshwat works at the Ames, the All India Institute of Medical Sciences in uh, uh, New Delhi, and uh, Sheshwat also has a strong link to, to Arkansas, and he is now an associate professor there, and uh, this is one of the busiest hospitals in the world, and the pathologies they see uh, is things you, um, you don't see. If, if there is any grading system, they usually see the largest grade and the most complex grade, so, and Sheshwat also evolved uh, just like uh, uh, all the uh, uh, younger people that are evolving into the cavernous sinus. This, this is actually, a, uh, to me, is a very rewarding great day because we were wondering how many people are going to be interested in the cavernous sinus if we do a session only about surgery in the cavernous sinus. But there's now about 900 people online between... Uh, you know, the Zoom and YouTube and uh, different parts of the world here in China. And to me, this is very special moment because uh, I knew that there are so many people who are interested in advancing this field. Uh, there is a lot of uh, interest, but unfortunately the, the forum to, to be exposed to how to do it doesn't exist in everywhere. And that shows the hunger 
of people wanting to learn it. So Sheshwat is gonna discuss a couple of cases, one uh, like where he feels his level of comfort and where he gets challenged with it. So when I come to my discussion, I will address how we can evolve to the highest level of performance in these cases. Sheshwar? Yeah. So, okay. Uh, is my screen visible? Yes, you're good to go. Yeah, okay. So uh, thanks, uh, Professor Krish. And I'm indebted to you for this opportunity to participate in this uh, very educating webinar. And uh, I had the opportunity to spend a year with him in 2011. And uh, since I came back, I tried to implement whatever I had learned there, and especially his philosophy and his way of doing things. And I've been uh, partially successful and I look forward to learning from him uh, like uh, this, like I uh, like he introduced this talk that uh, this would be something like uh, some cases where I feel I have developed confidence and some cases I feel where I still need help. So, so this is, uh, so this is the place I work. So it uh, looks more beautiful with the Corona epidemic because the air is much cleaner. There are people staying inside their homes. So, <laughs> so it, it gives a very pretty picture nowadays. Okay. So uh, for me, why the trans governance approach is important. Uh, so I feel that it is an important addition uh, to the Tirional approach that we already know. It greatly enhances uh, the applicability and the scope of this approach. And this is uh, not merely applicable to lesions of the cavernous sinus. And uh, it is, uh, as Dr. Krish says, it is not a destination, but a passage. And it, it is kind of, uh, uh, as we see in the, uh, in the fable, uh, the Arabian fable that uh, there was an open CSAM uh, kind of a buzzword which opened the gates to, you know, a dark, darkest of the caves. So for me, this is like the same thing. So the application of the trans governance approach may, makes those inaccessible areas of the brain uh, inaccessible through the Tiron approach more accessible to us. So uh, this is a kind of an overview of uh, just how the Tiron approach is helpful and how the trans governance approach adds to its scope. So this is the Tiron approach as described by a Professor Yasser Gill and it is, uh, it is applicable to a huge variety of lesions extending from, right from the anterior cranial fossa to the middle cranial fossa. And with the addition of uh, the uh, transcavernous exposure, we have the enhanced exposure of the paracellar prefontine region upper posterior fossa. So it, it is usually helpful for paracellar meningiomas, craniopharyngiomas, multi-compartmental giant pituitary adenomas. Uh, the idea is to uh, use this approach more frequently and, and, and to usually, and to utilize its, uh, uh, the way it expands the tutorial approach. So the chief advantages, which I feel are that it is, it is uh, by opening up uh, the different dural, uh, dural compartments and, and, uh, uh, and the dissection around the cavernous sinus, it helps to free up the cranial nerves and also the internal carotid artery, as uh, Dr. Sue had described. And it, it helps to widen the normal corridors that we usually utilize with the tyrannal approach and through this. So this is a small video of uh, uh, the initial case that I did. It was a tuberculum cell meningioma. And surprisingly, this patient had no perception of light in the left uh, eye. As, uh, there is a uh, VP was absent in the left eye. And uh, this is a typical tuberculum cell meningium approach through a tyrannal approach. And the usual steps of sphenoid ridge drilling, opening, uh, unroofing the superior optal fissure and, uh, and, and dividing the meningo orbital band, exposure of the anterior clinoid 
and then we remove the cloyne. The, the thing that is important here is to extensively remove the clinoid and deroof the optic canal all around like up to 270 de degrees so that we have a wide working window when we open up uh, the intradural compartment. So this is a uh, trans, uh, this uh, splitting of the sylvan fissure. And now we see, we can already see the tumor, which is almost uh, uh, compressing and almost obliterating the left optic nerve. So here we open up the dura right down to the clinoidal space to enlarge our walking window. And then we open up the optic nerve sheath. And this is very important uh, to, for the eight traumatic dissection of this uh, optic nerve. And you will realize how advantageous this proved to be for the patient. So now we uh, decompress the tumor in the usual fashion, and then we mobilize uh, the tumor away from the nerve. So at all points, we are very careful not to actually handle the nerve too much. And this is a uh, mobilization of the tumor away from the chiasm. We divide the uh, arachnoid bands sharply so that there is uh, no traction on the nerve at all. And then we remove the last bit here. And I was surprised that this patient actually recovered vision in a blind eye in which there was no uh, uh, visual level potential recordable earlier. So she can count fingers from her left eye now. And this was a recovery of the visual field. So this was a truly surprising and a truly fabulous results. So which got me uh, really hooked to the transcavernous approach for various paracellar and cellar regions, lesions. So so this can also be utilized for, as uh, Dr. Sue said, for the PCOM aneurysm here. So we are removing the clinoid, and this is a left PCOM aneurysm, left-sided approach. Here we remove the clinoid. And in this case, we have not opened the dura with the clinoidal space, but you can see that just removing the bone there makes the dural folds covering this region, covering the clinoidal region more mobile. So you have, in this case, without even opening the dura, you have a very good working window. And you can usually see the takeoff of the PCOM artery, the knuckle of the PCOM artery, and which will help in, uh, in making the clipping safer. So, So we place a temporary clip and then we place a permanent clip on the aneurysm. There you can see the uh, PCOM artery taking off from the ICA. So everything is visible and uh, you are very comfortable working in this uh, region. And I really like uh, the, uh, the trans tyrional transclinoidal approach for the PCOM aneurysms now. And I have a very low threshold for removing the ACP for PCOM aneurysms. Okay, so, and this is a case of a basal top aneurysm. So again, uh, the, the transcavernous approach enlarges the window so that we can have very good access to the prepontine region. So this is actually very beneficial for the prepontine region. And as Dr. Su said that he has already summarized that, that it is a, a, truly a wonderful approach for all these lesions going into the prepontine region, maybe uh, it may be a craniopharyngioma, an epidermoid, or, or this in this case, a basilar apex aneurysm. So we divide the middle meningeal, and in the usual manner, I'm dividing the orbital meningeal ba band here to uh, these V1, V2 come into view. And there is some bleeding from the uh, uh, space between V1, V2, you expect it and you seal it off with, a, with some gel foam and a surgery cell. So our, our patients usually cannot afford too much of a glue. Uh, so we usually try to economize on the use of glue, but this is, glue is actually the best method to control bleeding in, in the cavernous sinus region, but it still can be done with uh, pieces of gel foam and uh, surgery cell, as you can see here. And, and uh, the other thing important is to elevate the, uh, uh, the head by around 30, 40 degrees, which reduces uh, venous tension. 
another thing i have noted is that uh, if the brain is lax like if if the patient has hydrocephalus or or a patient has uh, uh, a large lesion in the, and if you place a lumbar vein if you re reduce the icp it reduces the venous oozing from the cavernous sinus also so uh, you should make all efforts to uh, reduce the venous pressure before dissecting the cavernous sinus region here i have made a, a, a open the sylvan fissure and this is the third nerve uh, clearly seen we mobilize the third nerve by opening up its foramen and then we remove the dura over over the region of the acp so that we have a wide working window to the uh, the basilar artery and the basilar trunk is visualized here this was a uh, this was a high riding basilar aneurysm so it was co going quite high up uh, in the prepontine region but as you can see the transcavernous approach it helps us to get a very good window to see and you know control the aneurysm in this case i was reluctant to place uh, temporary clips because uh, the arteries were all highly atherosclerosed but still we we could manage a, a good clipping of and the basilar apex in the patient did good but this is the case which i really found challenging this is a case of acromegaly and it came to us during the covid epidemic so uh, we were very reluctant to do a transphenoidal approach in this case and uh, as you can see it, it is a large large tumor going right up to uh, the third ventricle so anyway uh, 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 and a transphenoidal approach would have needed some kind of a extended endoscopic transphenoidal approach and even then it would have been difficult to to retrieve this this lobule here going right up uh, into the third ventricle so we chose to and this patient also has a trans has an extension to the cavernous sinus so and uh, we went ahead with a plan to to debulk the tumor as much as possible because we thought that uh, uh, if we reduce the tumor bulk then even the uh, actions of uh, adjuvant treatment methods like radio radio, radio surgery or somatostatin antagonist would be uh, more active so we went ahead with a, with a plan to to debulk the tumor as much as possible to remove the the cavernous sinus ex extension also and uh, this is so this is a, this is the axial view you can see that uh, and there is extension of the tumor into the cavernous sinus as well as into the cellular region and a large supracellular component so this is a, a video of the tumor here uh, i will show what the difficulties i encountered so as usual i start with a little bit of csf release from the sylvan fissure to uh, to relax the dural compartment which greatly aids uh, uh, the transcavernous uh, the the peeling of the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus so we divide the orbitomeningeal band just walking our blade over the face of the clinoid and this usually opens up uh, the plane between the two layers of the lateral cavernous Uh, a lateral wall of the cavernous sinus and then we can uh, proceed with uh, sharp dissection alternating with uh, blunt peeling to bring more and more of uh, the cavernous sinus wall into view so now we remove the acp and uh, this is this is a part of the optic strut that we are removing and we have, as you can see that we have already entered into the uh, sphenoid sinus uh, cavity so we seal it off with a piece of uh, a pack and then we proceed with the uh, intradural part of the surgery so now i open the sylvan fissure i uh, completely as far as possible and then i divide the dura right down up to the clinoidal space to enlarge the operating window there and uh, the problem i faced here was i was not sure of of the course of the third nerve and i was very uh, fearful of you know damaging it so i looked around a little bit 
and uh, I tried to uh, take down the uh, dissection of and the, uh, the peeling of the dura further, but uh, still I, 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 I was at a loss to, you know, be confident about the course of the third nerve. And then I could see tumor pouting out in the clinoidal space. So I went ahead and uh, decompressed the tumor. So I thought that this may, this might bring the nerve into view. And, uh, and also between the V1 and V2 uh, space, I went ahead and, and uh, removed a part of the tumor there. And this, is the, this is the V1 and this is the V2 there. So this part of the tumor, this part of the tumor was lateral to the uh, ICA, the cavernous ICA. So uh, I removed uh, this part of the tumor and then I could see that uh, there was no uh, further uh, tumor coming out. So I, I sealed this, this space uh, of the cavernous sinus off with uh, some packing of gel foam and then I turned my attention back to finding where the third nerve was. And I could finally locate it, but still mobilizing it was a tough task. And uh, I was then looking for the fourth nerve there and trying to create a window there. All in all, I was very uh, reluctant here. Uh, I was not very confident of the course of the various uh, uh, nerves along the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. So that led to a lot of uh, uh, reluctance on my part to go to chase the tumor. But still we got, uh, we, we mobilized, uh, we could see the cavernous ICA there, the posterior bend of the cavernous ICA. There you can see it. And I think uh, this is the part of the third nerve that was uh, 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 there. And this is now, now we have turned our attention to the suprasellar region. So I'm opening up the, uh, the dural rings here, cleaning up the dural rings. This is the, the distal dural ring. And then I just, this will help me increase this, uh, the, operate, uh, the operating corridor between the optic nerve and the ICA, the the supraclinoidal ICA. So I use this to decompress the tumor. And you can see that now the and, and then as, as you might remember that there was a portion of, a large portion of her going uh, into the sylvan fissure towards this fissure. So we bring that, uh, we focus our attention on that and try to remove it. So uh, with progressive decompression and dissection, we are finally able to remove that piece of tumor there. And uh, still I was uh, not... We, we cannot hear you. You are muted. Shashwa, you are muted. We couldn't hear the last thing you said. Okay, yeah. So, okay. Yeah, can, can you hear me right now? Yeah, we can hear you now. Yeah, yeah. So this was a, uh, this was a, a um, pituitary adenoma and as per Dr. Sue's classification, it is level three. But I still found it challenging because uh, especially I, I, I was not very confident of the course of the cranial nerves as I was dissecting them in the cavernous sinus. And I was still a, a little bit of lost uh, in, in while uh, chasing the tumor within the cavernous sinus. And I think that uh, probably Dr. Chris will shed some light. Probably I, the exposure was not uh, adequate for uh, this kind of tumor and how we can actually uh, safely do surgery for uh, invasive pituitary adenoma, especially for acromegalyx where it may be needed. So I would uh, now mm -hmm. like to uh, hand over the- Thank you, Shashwa. Thank you for your courage to show us your uh, challenge in this case and uh, clearly shows your uh, beautiful evolution into 
operating in this region. <clears throat> so I will address the question that uh, Sheshwat had, and I will uh, start my lecture here. So uh, uh, thank you for all the, the speakers. And uh, I, it was really enjoyable for me to see the fact that uh, cavernous sinus at different levels is being applied. And uh, I have no doubt that the future is going to be um, what uh, Professor Dolling said, that the cavernous sinus used to be no man's land, and one day it's going to be everybody's playground in a way. Um, before I start, uh, I would like to th thank Dr. Aboud, who has worked hard on putting this uh, webinar together, and uh, Ms. Gina Krisht, my uh, uh, daughter, who is the host, helping us, making sure that we don't mess up the technology part of it. Uh, so how to safely operate in, around, and through the cavernous sinus. Uh, this is our center here, which has the MG Azergill Neurosurgical Research and Education. And I think a lot you of you have- share your screen. I don't, I don't see it right now. My screen? Mm Can you see it now? No, you'll need to, did you click it at the very bottom? Share yeah, screen. I click share screen. Should I put leave and then share again? Yeah, try, try it one more time. One second. There you go. Okay. Okay, can you see it well now? Yeah, it looks good. Okay, good. So, and this is our center, um, which uh, we moved in about a year and a half ago. This was a vision of Professor Al Mefti and Professor Yazagil who joined us to establish this complex which has the hospital and the research and education building. And in it we have uh, the uh, Yazagil Neurosurgical uh, Research and Education Center and also has the, uh, the Osama Al Mefti Micro Neurosurgery Laboratory and also has a, uh, uh, I'll advance it here. This is our auditorium where we're connected to our operating room. And uh, our lab is uh, um, usually busy. This COVID uh, problem obviously has really affected our, the spirit of our education where we used to have courses almost every a couple of months on regular basis. Uh, we have uh, an average of 40 uh, or more participants in every one of our courses. And uh, it's uh, well attended and, and popular. The, this is the Evandro de Oliveira conference room. Dr. Evandro, one of my mentors who, as you know, is suffering from ALS has been a main major supporter for our program and uh, pushed me to achieving this vision and not giving up on it. So we want to welcome all of, all of you who are listening to us today. I'm really, like I said, very happy to know that there is a good 900 people around the world interested in learning how to operate in and around the cavernous sinus. The, the story of operating in the cavernous sinus is going to come down to understanding the cavernous sinus. Uh, going from a vague area to a clear area 
was led by Professor Yazagil when he made insular gliomas clear when they were vague and considered non-operable. And the way he did that is really by understanding the anatomy very well and the anatomy of the pathology very well and knowing where the traps are when you do surgery in this region to make it safe. And that's how he applied all this to where he taught us how to go from this to this in patients without worrying that there is gonna be a problem. So the same way can be applied to the cavernous sinus. Now what's stopping people from venturing into the cavernous sinus and trying to operate in the cavernous sinus? It is, it's really a pressure to be conformed to what's popular. And the popular message is the cavernous sinus is operating in it is part of history of neurosurgery and it's not part of the future. Out, that this is the future, it's part, part and parcel of the future of microneurosurgery. So um, in order to overcome this, we have to not assume a passive mind and just accept what is being regurgitated always as the norm because we will be giving in patients and we will be producing difficult to treat patients, which is happening every day. So each one should keep their creative mind. We should keep our active thinking so that we can take what we learn and transform it and make it more productive in a way when we apply it to patients. It's really, the, there, is a, there is a stagnation of thinking in our specialty. There is a lot of uh, hype about technology, but to the extent that nowadays you can see uh, technology being produced and we are trying to find indications for it. And that's because the thought process to what is needed is being kind of um, overcome by the pressure of someone coming to tell you what you need instead of you finding from what you're doing what you need. So how to apply this to the cavernous sinus? It comes with really knowing the cavernous sinus to the extent that you can see the outcome of an operation before you venture into it. And how do you do that? It's nothing more than the best example given by Michelangelo who after doing his sculpture so many times, he could see the angel in the marble that he can set it free. And this is how we set the cavernous sinus free from the tumor that's living in and around it. This is really a good example to present it in this way. And going to, to, to this level of uh, performance, you have to recognize that everything when it comes to uh, mastering any task we do, not necessarily in surgery, but in life, it is gonna go back to mastering the basics. That once you master the basics, then you can advance. If you wanna learn how to advance the specialty of mathematics, you have to learn the basics of math and then gradually build it up. And the same with physics, the same with everything. And that applies to what we do. Every, every task we do, every operation is like a, a mathematical equation that you're trying to solve. And once you know what the theorems and how they are, you can apply them, then it becomes easy to be performed. So this comes back to what Vicente presented. It comes back to the anatomy. But the knowledge of the anatomy really has to, to be at a certain depth which allows you to feel safe in the cavernous sinus. Um, for example, taking the case that uh, uh, Sheshwat presented, um, uh, in that case, the anatomy of the pathology would have helped me in how to approach it. And I'll mention it when I get to the point later on the pituitary adenomas. So, 
there is different levels of anatomy that needs to be uh, understood in the cavernous sinus. First is the basic anatomy, where things are. Two is the relation of the anatomy to the different approaches to the cavernous sinus. If you come from anterior, what view and where things are, if you come from lateral, if you come from more posterior, and if you open from more medial. It's like going into a room and not knowing the anatomy from entering through the door. You should be able to know if you go through the window where things are, if you come from the ceiling where things are. If you don't have that level of anatomy, the next level of anatomy, which is the pathologic anatomy, will not be easy to understand because once you know where things are in the normal state, then you know what happened to them in the abnormal state. And this is like knowing your house. If, if you go into your house and you know where the furnitures are, and if you find out that there is certain chairs and certain tables that were like upside down, you know the track of who came in and how did they walk into your house and because you know where things were displaced. And that's how you should know the anatomy. You should know it like your home. It should be your second home. The third level of anatomy is what I call the metric anatomy, which has to do with distances. You should be able to know how far is the fourth nerve from the carotid artery and at what level. For example, as you go distal, it goes over the third nerve, but a little proximal to it, it's very adjacent to the carotid artery. As you go more proximal and posterior, it goes away from the carotid artery. This distance knowledge is so important when you're dissecting those nerves because the whole surgery of the cavernous sinus is a dissection of the nerves. That's all what it is. Anytime you do surgery there and, it, it, and you start with not addressing the anatomy and defining it in the beginning, then your surgery is wrong. The whole tumor surgery is how to bring the anatomy out. When you start removing tumor, it is only a step to verify the anatomy. And once you verify all the anatomy, then whatever is rest, you can take out in a very quick and simple way. Then the surgeries, all of them become equal. Large tumor and small tumor becomes an equal task in a way. So different pathologies start from the, their origin are different. Those that come from medial, like some chordomas or pituitary adenomas, they're going to distort the carotid and the nerves in, in one way. Those that start within the cavernous sinus, depending where they start and how they grow, they'll do, distort them in different ways. And also depends on what location. Those, the schwannomas, they could be V1 schwannomas, they could be V2, V3, or Meckel's cave schwannomas. And each one grows in different ways. Pituitary adenomas are different. They start medially and they push laterally. And when they push, after a little while from pushing, then they start going around structures. But normally they are more expansile than infiltrating. But they have specific sites that they go to around the carotid and towards the Meckel's cave posteriorly under on the medial aspect of Meckel's cave. And this is the part which as it goes posterior, then if it becomes extensive, it goes more medial under Meckel's cave towards the uh, carotid uh, uh, canal in, in this way. If you don't know this distribution, what's gonna happen is you're gonna miss tumor behind. I always say when I'm operating on these tumors, the tumor can get, they can uh, the, uh, they can try to hide hide from me, but they will never be able to, because I know where they go to. So if you know where these tumors grow to, they can try to go around different structures. But you have to be intentional in finding where they are, because if you only remove what you think is in front of you and you don't know where they hide, 
then that's where you leave tumor. And for example, in pituitary adenoma, if you're doing a growth hormone secreting adenoma, like the one Sheshwat showed, my goal is really to, to try to achieve cure. And I know there is some uh, colleagues are gonna say, this is nonsense. You can never cure a, a growth hormone secreting adenoma. You can never cure this or that. You can, and we did. You cannot do it in every case, but you have to attempt in every case. The only way you can achieve it is if you know how to unfold every corner of the cavernous sinus and the different paracellar regions where these tumors hide. So understanding anatomy will lead to understanding the pathology. And when we understand anatomy, then even understanding the physiology of these lesions becomes more clear. We have to go to that level of understanding. So I will start with the meningiomas because you've seen how everyone has evolved and uh, the beautiful sequence that uh, of uh, evolution of operating in the cavernous sinus that uh, Samford presented leads to operating in the region of the cavernous sinus. And there, in my experience, it became clear where these tumors start is in this corner, which is on the posterior aspect to where the, the ascending carotid becomes the horizontal intracavernous carotid. It is where usually the meningeal hypophyseal artery is located. It's under the fourth nerve, medial to meckel scale, and above the Dorellos canal, and medial and inferior to the third nerve. It's in this corner where these lesions start, and they start growing in different directions to a different extent. And this is the, the, the knowledge of this information is what tells you where these tumors are going to grow and how they're going to distort the normal anatomy. Then when you're doing your operation, it is the reversal of the process of the growth of the tumor. So it is the tumor exploded out, you go in, find the nerves, and you implode the tumor in and go back to its epicenter and that's when you finalize and finish the work of removing the tumor. Now, the, 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 the knowledge available now and how it's being approached, there is even a recent webinar about the cavernous sinus and operating in that region. I listened to it uh, and um, my fellows showed it to me. Uh, I, you can tell both speakers are not qualified to talk about the cavernous sinus. They should not they should have chosen something else, maybe talk about convexity meningioma or something like that. And, and the reason is in the lack of knowledge and it is well exemplified in this article which was published about evolution and treatment of cavernous science meningioma. And as some of the speakers mentioned before, they, they are in the region of the cavernous sinus. This is what, like this media sphenoid wing meningioma that uh, Samford mentioned, this is not a cavernous sinus meningium, but operating in that region leads you to understanding and operating around the cavernous sinus. When you try to achieve Simpson grade one, not if you go intradurally and you just suck the tumor and leave the dura around, it doesn't work like this. You will always leave then the dura laying on the cavernous sinus wall. But what is disturbing is when you look at this what's called primary intracavernous meningioma. This is a wrong picture, which was published in one of our journals. And you can tell the, the, the authors didn't know the anatomy and the reviewers didn't know the anatomy because if I was a, one of the reviewers, I would say, I'm sorry, this is wrong. This is a wrong depiction of the pathology of these tumors in that region. The, the nerves are on the surface. They're not inside the tumor when it comes to cavernous sinus meningiomas. Now that approach has led to, to mishandling these tumors over the years. And when uh, you have a good number of meningiomas that are gonna grow whether you radiate or not, this is what you end up with. Outcomes like this case. And I really have so many patients. I use this case because it's a good example of it. 
but this patient has been going on with treatments for more than 15 years or so. Started with uh, partial resection of a tumor, radiation, then more radiation, radiosurgery, more tumor growing, more debulking. And if you notice by the end of so many years, the patient has a huge tumor inside the uh, uh, orbit and the compressing the optic nerve. She's blind, she has ophthalmoplegia and uh, she still has tumor within the cavernous region. And it is the only thing missing really is the temporal lobe here. And this is not where we need to be. I think if we are able to take these patients and treat the, the tumor like we treat other tumors in different areas where we feel comfortable. If we go to meningioma of the parasagittal region and we resect it, sometimes we leave tumor attached to the wall of the uh, sinus and we follow it. And what we do, if it's a grade one, we take this patient back 15 to 20 years. So we gain a symptom-free and di free disease-free of progression for many, many years. And if somebody is 60 years or 65 years, if you give them up to 80 without worrying about the tumor, you have achieved a lot for these patients. And this is how we should think also of the cavernous sinus. These tumors have been growing for a long time. By the time they come and they start becoming symptomatic, they start having double vision, some of them extending to the optic nerves, some to the posterior fossa. They start losing sensation, start going towards the seven and eight complex. You can bring this tumor out. Yes, there may be some tumors where they're very stuck to the carotid. You leave a sliver around the carotid if you know how to do the surgery. But you've taken these patients back 15 to 20 years, you gave them a high quality functions and with full recovery of the cranial nerves. And this nonsense that is still being talked about that you cannot, there is no way on earth, there is, it's impossible to save the nerves and remove the bulk of the tumor. I can tell everybody who doesn't believe it, they just have to visit with us and see, and we will be happy to have them see our patients. But this is possible nowadays. And this is a routine in our institute. And I'm sure in many of those uh, speakers institute, it's, a, it's, it's already there or it's gonna become there pretty soon. I'm very optimistic of the future of this uh, treatment. And in this case, you can see we, we did a, a good resection. There's no really any tumor left, but unfortunately the morbidity is decided and we don't want to be at this point in time, because if we can achieve this now, we should have achieved it many years before when she still had her vision and cranial nerves. So we have to stop doing incomplete uh, jobs on these patients. And the idea that uh, there is another option to use, which is radiosurgery that keeps it under control and so on. Well, I look at it in a different way. I'm not gonna use radiosurgery and I don't think anyone is gonna use radiosurgery on a convexity meningioma. Why? Because a lot of people feel comfortable operating on a convexity meningioma. They feel like, no, this is, this is a surgical case. We have to treat it just like when you do an AVM, which is grade one, nobody wants to radiate a grade one AVM. And why? Because there's a lot of surgeons who feel comfortable. So what we need to do is is to establish this comfort level because this is really the best treatment option to start with. Radiation is not a treatment. Radiation, the way it was introduced is to be to treat cancers and it's not a treatment for benign lesions because there is even some benign lesions that are gonna change uh, in their behavior. And meningiomas are one of those and Dr. Al-Mefti has published on this on patients who has, whose tumors have exploded over time. So this approach, you can tell it's decided by the comfort level of the surgeon, which I can understand, but at the same time, we shouldn't preach our limitations as the standard. That's a wrong approach. 
we should aspire to a much better standard for our patients because this is not treating the surgeon, this is treating the patient and we should tailor our treatment to the patient and not to ourselves. So yes, we failed in the past, but it is wrong to look at it as a, 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 a game changer. It's only an opportunity so we can use it to achieve more successes by looking at the reasons for our failure. If every time you fail, you give up, then we're gonna change course and the curve of our specialty and the outcome of our patients is gonna completely off where we want it to be. So how can I claim that I know where these meningiomas grow? It's very simple. You look at the anatomy of these lesions and correlate it with the radiologic findings in different sized tumors. So if you look at this uh, uh, example that I show, this is in the lab, which was beautifully done by Dr. Aboud when we discussed the so simulated. And then this is a tumor which is small that you can see in that corner of the cavernous sinus under the fourth nerve, sixth nerve. It's a patient who presented with a sixth nerve palsy. And to me, this is a surgical lesion. It's not a radiation. When it's big, get bigger, you can see exactly where these lesions grow. They grow along the tentorium. In that corner, they start going into Meckel's cave, under fourth nerve, and then they go towards the cella and then posteriorly, they go through the uh, petroclival dura to the posterior fossa. This is the third nerve. You see the third nerve is still on the surface, fourth nerve on the surface, V1, V2 are on the surface. The tumor sneaks into Meckel's cave region. And then as they get bigger, they start going along the tentorium and then through the superior leaflet of the tentorium into the middle fossa that like you see here. And eventually they can become more extensive. This is a case referred to me that you see that was radiated many times, different types of radiation from gamma knife to conventional radiation to proton beam therapy. And this patient was told to go home and die really. And again, all what you see missing, unfortunately is only the part of the temporal lobe. Now, when these tumors become quite large and the surgery is the same, whether it's a big tumor or a small tumor, because the surgery is no more done on the tumor, it is done on the nerves themselves. So our lack of knowledge and ignorance about the cavernous sinus is what led a lot of people to consider it complex, non-operable and very morbid area. And our knowledge is what leads to making it feel very simple to navigate and operate in that region. So let's take a case like this and I'll walk you through the steps and I'll try to elaborate more on it. This is a tumor which is living exactly where I mentioned there. Notice here that this tumor is in the tentorium. And then when it comes forward, it becomes like wider. It fattens into the cavernous sinus, and then it goes lateral and drapes over the carotid under the nerves in the Meckel's cave region. So that's why I really like to use the term cavernotentorial meningiomas. This is a more accurate depiction of what these tumors are all about. So the surgery is done like uh, you've seen some of the speakers introduced before. I start with the middle meningeal artery. Why? Because the middle, middle meningeal artery is a tethering point that prevents the dura di being dissected all the way back along the tentorium. And this, if you don't disconnect it, it's going to hinder you. So when you start dissecting, I prepare it first so that I have a flow of my dissection instead of coming back to do it later. It just enhances the surgery as you're going further away from it. And we cut it close to the dura. And then once you, you can see, it's important to not cut it close to the foramen spinosum. 
and so that you can have a little stump so you can uh, close it. Um, afterward, then we expose the middle fossa and then you can see now the tumor bulging in this region. And this is V1, this is V2, V3. Fourth nerve is somewhere here and you'll see it, we will identify it. And this is what I expect the, the third nerve to be. And then uh, the tumor you can see here, it looks like it is around the nerve, but it's not. The nerve is on the surface. You can dissect it and follow it back. And then you can see tumor already herniating through Meckel's cave. So this tumor went through the medial wall of Meckel's cave in that corner, which is the posterior part of Parkinson's triangle to fill the Meckel's cave. So it is on both sides of the dura. So there are certain dura leaflets which you have to understand that the tumor is going to be on both sides of them. It is going to be on both sides of Meckel's cave. It's going to be on both sides of the Petrus dura. It's going to be on both sides of the Clival dura. So when you know, and then it's going to be both sides of the tentorial dura, which is the, the, the dura propria of the temporal lobe and the, the level here. That's where the tumor from this point grows into this. However, when you dissect, even though the tumor has gone in and it is inside the dura, on the outside, once you split this area, the nerves are still on the surface. So it grows from this point up through the dura into the interdural space in the middle fossa and out. So there are four dura leaflets where the, the tumor grows on both sides of them. And this is really the epicenter of the growth of these tumors. Occasionally, they can sneak in along the carotid towards the cella and push against the uh, pituitary gland in that region. So going back to, to uh, Again, this slide, uh, this is the dissection, verifying all the different structures, then removing the clinoid process. And the importance of removing the clinoid process is you want to identify the third nerve on, on the lateral aspect. Then we start dissecting the fourth nerve that you see it's coming out. And the fourth nerve dissection, once you get the fourth nerve out of the way, the surgery collapses, everything becomes clear. The only second challenge you have is the sixth nerve. The third nerve is never a challenge. So you have, in order to do that, you have to open intradurally and find the nerves so that you can see the tumor here and there is tumor here, tumor here, and this is delineated artistically to show it. And then the next thing is to take the third nerve, fourth nerve, and mobilize them out of the way. Then you open a big space behind the carotid, which has the bulk of the tumor. On the medial aspect, you have to find the sixth nerve, which runs under V1. So in this case, we skeletonize the fourth nerve, and then the third nerve is skeletonized. And in this case, I used one with a smaller tumor so you can see the anatomy well. In another patient, this will be filled more with tumor, but the nerves are identified. What's the difference between the two cases? You either cut a small piece of tumor or you cut a big piece of tumor. The surgical time becomes equivalent because the surgery is no more on the tumor, it's on the nerves. Now, in this case, the tumor under fourth nerve goes into Meckel's cave. This is the tentorial edge, which was split. Part of the dura is up here, which has some tumor, and part of the dura, which is the roof of Meckel's cave. So now we skeletonize the third nerve to make sure that there is, it's cleaned, and usually tumor grows in larger portions in, in this area. So once we get fourth and third, we have unlocked a large area in this region, which has only the sixth nerve that we need to find out. And then you can debulk all this tumor very nicely after mapping where the carotid is.
And the carotid, you know now that the carotid is clinoidal segment is up here, then you can follow it. So now we are opening the Meckel's cave and unroofing it, which is really the inferior layer of the tentorium itself. You can see the tumor in Meckel's cave. And the, sometimes the, the, there are cases where when the tumor is big, it feels like they are intertwined with the nerves. They're usually big lobules that you can ease out very well in this case. So the next thing we need to do in this case is to find where the uh, sixth nerve is located. Now, there are specific landmarks to help you find the sixth nerve. This is just showing some tumor growing through the dura into Meckel's cave. And you can see it, it kind of split the nerve some. The majority of time, it doesn't. Now, this is the sixth nerve. This is the V1, I mean, the, the rootlets area, Meckel's cave, V1 is here. Fourth and third nerve is here. So how to find the sixth nerve? Sixth nerve comes from the undersurface of V1. And once you delineate the carotid, this is the carotid here. This is the ascending in the cavernous carotid. The sixth nerve leaves the V1 and goes down towards the Rellus canal behind the ascending carotid. It's almost a constant. Occasionally, I have seen in dissections one case where it was more anterior in this, I mean, more media. But it's very clearly in that location. The way to identify it here could be a little bit difficult. And many a times the tumor pushes it more posteriorly. So one way to know where it is, is to find the petroclival ligament. Once you know the petroclival ligament, and you know where the Gasserian ganglion is, you know that's where the nerve is gonna come in this trajectory going down anterior to the ligament. So you know what's posterior to it is safe all the way back to the brainstem. So you start resecting it and this will allow you to see that the nerve at the brainstem. And once you see it there, you start following it and you go from normal to abnormal and then you, that's how you clean the nerve and establish its window. So there is there is a like a road map that nowadays we can follow. Once we get this identified, then everything else in between is tumor that you can clean. This is the petroclival junction, which is filled with tumor that's involving the bone. Now because the tumor becomes like chordomas in a way in this region. And chordomas is it's the same, except the chordomas are much more delightful because they are softer. So in this case, we remove the whole petroclival bone and then, which, we, which is the posterior clinoid and part of the clivus. And then what we are left here, you can see is tumor. This is the tail end of it, medially and inferiorly going. And I can go here all the way to the uh, vertebrobasal junction. And then you just cut tumor. And you never have to dissect anything away from the brain. Why? Because you are imploding the tumor towards the epicenter away from the arachnoid and the structures in the posterior fossa. So that by the time you're done, you can see the anatomy fully where the sixth nerve coming up. This is Meckel's cave clean. This is the fifth nerve. This is V3, V2, V1. GSPN and fourth nerve going over third nerve. And you can see it's a panoramic view without you know having to see much brain. This retractor is barely laying over the, the temporal lobe. Uh, and, and it follows the contour. It's like hugging the temporal lobe and going around it. So this is achievable in every case. The only thing that's left here is small sliver of tumor, which is around the carotid. And the carotid is in this case coming this way. And sometimes it may follow the carotid to the carotid canal and the foramen lacero. But in that case, in those cases, the future is how we are going to get rid of the carotid, replace it, and then we can achieve Simpson grade one. But 
we're doing exactly what we do with other tumors in this case. If you're operating on a clinoidal meningioma, sometimes you, piece, you leave a piece of tumor attached to the middle cerebral artery. You may leave a piece of tumor attached to a vein of Trollard or vein of Labe, depending on the location of the tumor. If we are justified to do this somewhere else and we know we can be safe here, there's no reason why we cannot do it. And avoid giving radiation to the patient, avoid the future morbidity, and at the same time, preserve the nerves. You can see this view. This is six nerve on the right side. This is the Meckel's cave where the tumor was. The carotid comes this way. And this is fourth nerve. This is the basilar. And this is the sixth nerve on the opposite side. In every case, if I did not see the sixth nerve, it means I didn't go down enough along the clivus and I did not remove the tumor, the tail end of it. Larger tumor, it's the same application. You can see how the tumor follows the tentorium. And that's why I call it the cavernous tentorial and in geomas. And the application of what to, to do is the same. And when we are, I'll just go forward a little bit. We start with the extradural part. This is the part which we clean. And then that's the fourth nerve. You can see the silhouette of the carotid. And once we finish cleaning this part, then we open the dura along the subtemporal region. And this dura is usually involved with tumor and larger tumor, like in like this case. So if you look carefully here, we're cutting the anterior aspect of the tentorium, which is part of the dura propria of the temporal lobe, and there is tumor on the inside. That's tumor, which is in this case overlying over the third nerve, because the, the uh, tumor distorts the third nerve more medially and goes through the tura in that region. So this purple dough simulates a tumor in that location. So again, this is all anatomic dissection, application of your knowledge to the anatomy. You see here, this is third nerve. This is third nerve. So you can see how distorted the third nerve. You would think that the third nerve is going this way. And if you do not see the normal third nerve at the superior orbital fissure and the normal third nerve intradurally down here, then you're gonna injure it. And this is how a lot of previous surgeries were wrongly done. So now we will apply this knowledge. I'm looking at it. I can see the nerve intradural and all this dura which is involved with tumor is being cut. So notice removal of tumor is not done because I am working on the tumor. It is done because I am working on delineating the nerves. So I'm cutting, look at this third nerve here. You see how distorted it is. So this is easy to miss, but in this case, I could see it intradurally. And now once we finish, you can see the anatomy completely clear. And that's the carotid, the fourth nerve, third nerve, uh, opposite third nerve. And it's the same view in every case. This is the whole anatomy and that's how this looks. And this is a good example to show how these tumors, yeah. the patients move their no. eyes post-op no. and it uh, depends on how no hard to soft the tumor in some cases, but the, the, in every case, there is functions preserved, and if not, they usually recover fully. Six nerve was a challenge, and six nerve has to be understood. This is the four, V1 being lifted as it comes down to Meckel's cave. This is the Gasserian ganglion region, and this is where the nerve leaves V1, comes down along the ascending carotid. This is a horizontal carotid. 
and goes towards hmm, Torello's canal. So I, in this case, once I map the carotid, I estimate where the nerve is, then I go more posterior and find the petroclival ligament, then I know the nerve is anterior to it. So you immediately kind of delineated the course of the nerve. And if this is, there is a tumor there, you know there is nerve in it, you just gently dissect to see the nerve. If you have a little difficulty, you go to where the nerve is normal. To go to where the nerve is normal, you have to unlock this region of the Rellus Canal. This is a tight area. The problem, I think, the difficulty I had earlier is I could not dissect here comfortably when there is, it's packed with tumor, even if I cut the dura posteriorly. And the reason is the nerve is draped also over the medial aspect of the petrous bone. And if you have to remove this petrous apex and its junction with the lateral extension of the clivus, then you open that space and that's what will allow the dissection of the nerve to become easier. So this is showing the removal of the apex and you can see here how tight the nerve is next to the bone. If you take all this bone, it's almost removing the posterior clinoid from under the optic nerve. This is, imagine this optic nerve, this is clinoid. And if you have an enlarged clinoid compressing the nerve, and that's exactly how it is done. So now that we removed it, you can see the nerve completely free and you find it in this region and you follow it. And usually it is surrounded by tumor here, but once you debunk this region, you can see the nerve and you can appreciate it here, starting all the way from this region up. And removal of this part will also allow you to see lateral to the uh, takeoff of the fifth nerve. I'm cutting the nerve to show you the course of the sixth nerve. And in these cases, if there is significant extension laterally, these are the cases that you may have to remove the petrous apex. But the majority of these tumors are living more medial than lateral to this region. So this is an example, a case that we did last week. I wanted to, it's fresh. I wanted to use it as an example. Uh, this patient was having a progressive third and sixth nerve palsy, significant changes in it. And these are the steps of the surgery. The extradural components are left-sided. So this is the middle meningeal artery. This is frontal, and this is temporal in this area. And these are the uh, tack of dural stitches. And this is the meningeal orbital band with the meningeal orbital artery in it. And we're cutting it. And this is where you start the dissection process along the lateral edge of the clinoid. And we start getting the V1, V2, V3 exposed. Again, the tumor is not in, in, you know, going around them in a way. This is GSPN, V3, V2, and This is, you see how posterior you need to go on these cases because you need to follow the tumor along the tentorium. Now, once you finish this extradural part, the next thing is, in this case, there was tumor involving the bone between V1 and V2, which we removed that led to the sphenoid sinus. This is important to, re, uh, in some cases, um, widen the V3 window because you can to help you mobilize the V3, V2 space. You will track the carotid because the carotid comes in the petrous segment and then it loops in the canal. It will give you a good definition of all the anatomy of the carotid. And that's what you see. Then we open, uh, we will remove the clinoid process. The reason to remove the clinoid process just like uh, Vicente mentioned, is really to identify the optic nerve and the third nerve. You need, the third nerve is always normal at the level of the superior orbital fissure. 
So this is one end of the normal, and then you want to find the other end of the normal. So this is the cavernous, the clinoidal carotid here, and that's the third nerve. This is the third nerve. And now we're cutting the uh, oculomotor carotid membrane so that you can delineate the third nerve. And I have everything now extradurally delineated. Now I find my fourth, this is for the fourth nerve. You'll see it in a second. This is the, the GSPN again. Okay, so now we're finding the fourth nerve. And in this case, it was pushed by the tumor medially. And you can see it, V2, V1, V3, and the anatomy gradually starts coming out. Again, all this is neural dissection. I'm not doing anything yet on the tumor. I'm just, whatever tumor I cut is delineated. Once I do that, I open the dura in the subtemporal region. And you can see the tumor going through the dura into the middle fossa. And now we will, this is a dead tumor because we devascularize it from the outside. This is the optic nerve, the carotid. And now we cut this tumor. But to do that, you, I have to find out third nerve and fourth nerve. So I can skeletonize from normal to normal, from normal to normal. And this will debulk a large part of tumor. So this is the third nerve. You can see it was distorted. We cut all this tumor from above it. And then the next thing is to find the fourth nerve as it enters intradurally. This is the fourth nerve. You can see it here, intradural in the perimesencephalic system. The next thing is to bridge the nerve from here to here. And you will see the delineation of it in a second. You see, this is a drawing of where the nerve is going. But it's under this layer. But this is just to guide you how the process is being done. The next thing is we get that piece of tumor out. You see the fourth nerve, third nerve. Now we go to Meckel's cave. And then this is still opening the fourth nerve canal. And now you can see the fourth nerve all the way into the posterior uh, in, uh, perimesencephalic system. So now we mobilize fourth and third. And you have the petroclavial junction behind the carotid. This is all involved with tumor going down to the posterior fossa. You see now this medial side is safe because the sixth nerve is lateral. Knowing the anatomy where things are allows you to operate better. Now we removed this part. You can see the basilar starting to show up all the way to the supracellular region. Now next we're gonna come and remove this part of the tumor, which is over Meckel's cave and the part which is part of the tentorium, which is above these nerves. This is tumor here. This is still more, I guess, showing back the uh, medial part. This is the pituitary gland region. The pituitary gland is here. The tumor is reaching that region. This is clinoidal carotid coming down. So now we are cutting Meckel's cave roof. This is Meckel's cave roof. And you can see now the rootlets and the tumor is pushing, squishing them laterally. I'm behind the carotid. And now I could see the sixth nerve. Why? Because I know where my V1 is. And I know I will show you just to show how earlier it was not clear. 
but I know my brain eye could see the nerve because I know the course of the nerve. This is the carotid. I know it's coming, just leaving V1 and coming down. So I know it's gonna be here. So this is what my brain was seeing, this picture. So now we are working on getting the petroclival bone. In this case, it was calcified and the petroclival ligament was calcified. So I know the nerve is anterior to it. And now we're removing the petroclival ligament and the medial part. This will allow me to dissect the six nerve. So now if you look at this picture, this is six nerve next to the brainstem, tumor around it, tumor around it. Now I found it. I know where it is up here. I know where the carotid is. Then I can follow it and clean all around it. It's all a same stepwise dissection that you do to every nerve, but because you understand the anatomy, then you can clean it to the extent that we are doing. We are flush with the carotid, and in all these cases, whatever left is usually a very small piece. And now you can see the sixth nerve all the way coursing up to under V1. The view starts becoming similar to every case you have seen before. Sixth nerve on this side, fourth nerve, third nerve, carotid. And again, this is the view you see. When you delineate it, this is the carotid. Fifth ner sixth nerve, B1, fifth, fifth nerve. This is the course of the carotid. Fourth nerve, third nerve, optic nerve. And then we will should be able to see the opposite. This is the basilar artery. And you should be able to see the opposite um, the, the place, yeah. And you can see in all these patients, there's a little sliver of tumor and the bulk of it is all removed. And this patient, uh, he's, you can see she had a partial third pre-op. And if you look at their functions, this is six nerve is preserved. Look at this on that side. And the third was partial from pre-op. It was a little worse. This will recover fully. In this case, this was last week, an example. Same bigger tumor, we approach it the same way. This patient I've seen yesterday, I had new videos on it. And I want to show you just quickly the end and how the tumor looks when we clean it. Same, all this. This is the sliver around it, the carotid, and this is about three months later, full recovery of our six tumor. And it applies to all the patients we have on follow-up. So this is our experience in the last 24 patients that I've applied this, now the 26, including the two cases from last week. We don't have no new permanent deficits in the third nerve. And the same with the abducer nerve. The abducer nerve, however, if there is pre-op deficit, it's a problem if they are complete because the recovery in these patients was five of them did not recover. This is why just sitting on a progressive uh, tumor growth on the sixth nerve, it doesn't work. And I've heard also some who say you can use radio surgery and sometimes it improves on the nerves. I would like to, to, to make sure to clarify this. This is, this is assuming or taking credit for something you haven't done. By the nature of this disease, I have seen patients who have cavernous sinus meningiomas who develop six nerve palsy at one phase of the tumor growth, and then they improved afterward. And then later, if you wait long enough, they will start getting worse. So if you'd give radiation, you take the credit for their improvement while they were going to improve on their own. So it doesn't work like this. I, it doesn't just doesn't make sense that that you are giving, uh, you know, you're you're injuring the nerves in the wall with radiation, and they're going to improve, and they're being compressed by the tumor. Because we know the majority of these tumors do not shrink in size and from radiosurgical treatment. 
The trochlear also, patients 24, they recover very well. I have one patient uh, that I repaired and it looked like it recovered. So I'm not sure if it's a recovery or these patients adjust, their brain adjusts later. So coming to the other tumors, this is an example of a schwannoma. And I, I want to use this because this is where you have the two compartments involved. And this should be done in the right way. I have seen so many different approaches. Some have presented cases with like two to three approaches. I've even seen an endoscopic approach to this uh, tumor. And I have recently looked at a video where somebody cut the nerves. He, he really casually showing it and says, oh, this is a nerve which was involved with tumor, cut a big trunk, like almost the whole V2 or V3. It was, it looked messy. And this is all out there giving the wrong message to what we can do. This is a tumor which has to be really approached in the best panoramic view that will allow you to see the whole tumor, intra, extradural, and middle fossa and posterior fossa. And there is no better way than to unlock the whole cavernous sinus and open it up and visualize this tumor. This is the fourth nerve. And in this case, we're gonna take the third nerve and fourth nerve, mobilize them, find sixth nerve, and you can then delineate exactly where the tumor is, both in the Meckel's cave region and in the posterior fossa. So now we will dissect them, get them out of the... Now, why do we do this? Because we need to cut the tentorial roof so that we can see the panoramic view of the middle fossa and the posterior fossa. So I find the sixth nerve here. This is petroclavial ligament. This is fifth nerve. Tumor is filling this region. And I found the sixth nerve by knowing where the V1 coming to Cassidian ganglion and behind the carotid. And that's fourth nerve. Third nerve is here. So I know where to find it. So now I map the whole anatomy of this region. I can see the brainstem, the tumor in the brainstem region. Now, because I moved all these nerves out of the way, I will cut the roof of Meckel's cave. And then all of a sudden you're looking at the tumor in the posterior fossa. You can see it here. This is tumor and tumor in the middle fossa. And then once you do this, and instead of this nonsense that I saw in a video where they cut the nerves to be able to see the tumor, then you look and you inspect right side, left side, medial, etc. Look at how the nerves are all draped on the tumor. There is no, the, if you cut, you're going to cut nerves. So you need to find a window. This is all nerves, and that's the arachnoid. You leave it nicely preserved. So now I went back to the region of Meckel's cave. This is V1. Now I know where carotid, sixth nerve, fourth nerve, third nerve, and I have a beautiful view from medial and lateral, and then move the fifth nerve at Meckel's cave, and then you find tumor. And then you don't cut any fascicle except maybe one little piece which is going to be part of the tumor. And then you start dissecting and decompressing the tumor. And then this is the view that you see the view, the nerve is distorted, the tumor and Meckel scale is being removed. And next, you will work on the tumor which is in the posterior fossa. Oops. So now this is the nerve and you're removing the tumor from lateral to it. And you have the whole bundle seen and you can see the nerve coming down and that's the view that you end up with. And by the time you finish the resection, everything is preserved and everything is under view. And 
I think we have to become more demanding from our colleagues for, you know, not allowing what is being displayed. And nowadays, everyone has access to YouTube, access to all these webinars and so forth. And unfortunately, there's so many messages which are going in the right direction. And um, it, it, has, it has to be fixed. This is the post op you can see it in this case. But Twitter had no more coming to what Cheshwat said. These tumors, I look at them as tumors that should always stay extra dural. So when I approach even invasive tumors like this, I don't go intradurally. And I go from lateral, I go inside the tumor and I stay in the tumor. The only time I would go intradural is I'll open a little slit of dura like I have done in these cases earlier, is to push the tumor down once you decompress from within. And the capsule of the tumor and the dura to me is like the diaphragma cell. So I try not to violate it at all. I try to push it down and I stay from within. And usually in these cases, like you see here, the approach and the fact that these tumors are relatively softer allows you to clean them no matter how big they are and push them down in, the, in this way. And the important thing to realize is these tumors can hide in post, around the carotid posterior to medical scape and they can be difficult to find. But this is the view I see and I barely open this area. I leave, really keep it closed. Usually there's dura here. And then this is the view that I like to see and the tumors push the carotid laterally. So I will operate in between the different structures in this area. And you can achieve cures in these patients like this ACTH producing tumor. This is a more recent case that I'd like to present because this patient was operated on somewhere else, I think also endoscopically, and removed the tumor, which was a Cushing's patient. And the, the patient was not cured. So if you look at the scans here, there may be some tumor on this side, but uh, it looks normal in a way. But this patient is, still has the disease. The petrosal sinus sampling were very positive on the left side. So I discussed it with the patient. I said, I know where they hide. We can explore it, but we will do it like under the brain behind the eye. It's really extradural, predominantly surgery. And that's what we did in this case. And this is the window we opened. And in this case, the tumor was just behind the carotid behind the posterior genu of the cavernous portion. And it's not, this is what you're gonna miss unless you have this approach to get to this point, you will not be able to cure this patient. So in this case, this is the course of the carotid. We unlocked all this region and this is the pituitary gland carotid and the tumor, which was lateral and posterior. You can see where it is. Now removing the tumor became, it's, it's a simple par with this approach. And you can see the whole surgery is done extra duty. And this patient is, is cured. That's the big advantage. You can imagine the morbidity of this patient. They're gonna tell her you have a normal gland uh, looking. They may consider radiation for it. She's gonna be on medication for a long time and the morbidity of the disease will stay with her. And there is a big advantage of knowing the anatomy of the cavernous sinus and cellar and paracellar region because there is so much we can give patients if we know how to use it in a safe way and know the anatomy of this region. So I'll skip to other case. This is post-op. You can see the functions of the patient. They have mild weakness of the nerve, but they will recover fully. And if you know how to manipulate those nerves and the way to dissect them and handle them, there's a certain way the dissection process should be done in a tangential way and always dissecting the tissue around it and not the tissue of the tumor. Um, well, I will, uh, there's a lot to talk about the cavernous sinus, but at least I am hoping that I gave 
and an overview of the thinking, and I'm very optimistic of the future. I'm gonna show just skip some of the tumors like the chordomas and others. Uh, th this is just to show you one case. This case is a, is a, a glioma of the um, mammillary bodies going down to the prepontine region. The view we got when we opened this, I will show you. In this case, this is where the tumor was and everything was above it. Again, this is an approach we did, a full transcavernous approach to get to that region in order to clean this tumor. And this is how this looks post-op. You can see the, uh, the whole tumor. This was a polycytic astrocytoma. This is a patient who can be cured and that's the advantages. Um, the chordomas, similar to pituitary adenomas, they're not, they're really much less, uh, to me, a challenge uh, because of our ability to clean them well. But I'll skip to the vascular part for the sake of time and go to my conclusion. Th this is a very low, uh, again, full transcavernous approach. And you can see the tumor. This was in the mid clivus, which is a chordoma. And this is the carotid. Pituitary gland is here, third nerve and fourth nerve. And again, unlocking all this space under the brain. You can see that by the time we are removing the tumor, we've already removed all the bone involved at the petroclival junction. This is where they arise. And that's a big advantage over the endoscopic approach. You are there to clean that tumor well. This is the sixth nerve that you see here. And that's the final view of removing this tumor. This is the dura here and the sixth nerve in the lab. And we're applying this anatomy to clean this tumor completely. And this patient has been almost now 40 years, I think, or so, getting close to five years with no other aid. This is, you see what I'm talking about. You're, you're chasing every bit of the tumor along the spectroclival junction. And that's the sixth nerve, fifth nerve, carotid. And again, this is more tumor being removed. This is the sixth nerve, third nerve on the opposite side, chasing the tumor down. Sixth nerve on the opposite side. You can see all this being clean. So with aneurysms, I am happy that um, our previous speakers discussed how the paraclinoid and the pecan and uh, a lot of aneurysms in that paracellar region can be treated. And um, I will address the big advantage that I've had is in, in paraclinoid aneurysm, but this is subject of another talk. But with basilar aneurysms, they have a high rate of recurrence. I want to stop here and give a lot of credit for my teacher, Dr. Uh, Evandro, who really, uh, him and, prof and from Professor Yazigan, and of course, from Dr. Almefti too, who has uh, pushed me a lot with doing more for aneurysm, especially basilar apex aneurysm with the transcavernous approach. You know, Evandro used to always say that, you know, when do people think surgery is superior option when done at superior level? He's very right about that. So with uh, this case is an aneurysm that uh, is done through a variant of the transcavernous approach. I always get asked, you know, do you do this on every case? I do the approach on every case, but I don't do all the steps in every case. Sometimes you have to remove posterior clinoid, sometimes you don't. So the third nerve, I like to mobilize it because it allows it to recover. And the manipulation around it when it's not tight is, is much better. And I'm tickled to see how uh, Sheshwat is feeling comfortable now gradually with doing 
basilar apex aneurysm and the same like I'm sure uh, uh, the other speakers as well. And the approach is based on the temporal region and a larger temporal than frontal approach. Now, when we expose this area, you don't have to go like tumor all the way back, but you still need to go to the petrous apex, unless if it is a very low lying aneurysm, then you have to do a full transcavernous approach. And this is the window you see that when we start, it's very tight. You can imagine if we did a pterional approach, how tight this is, or if you do a subtemporal approach, you only see barely part of the uh, basilar. So in this case, necessitated removing the posterior clinoid, cutting PCOM, and you get a wide view like this. This is the clip and a clip here on the basilar and on the P1. And the view is, is really majestic. You, can, you cannot go wrong by not being able to see a perforator and catching it. So in real surgery, this is what it looks like. And I will speed it up. This is the same case with the pictures that I have shown. And then the, the removal of the posterior clinoid mobilizing the third nerve, cutting the PCOM, and all at the perforator free zone. And then you, you move the third nerve and move that perforator out of the way. And then you're looking at the aneurysm and all the perforators, and you have a full view of the anatomy posterior and anterior, so that by the time you put the two clips, then you are looking at the aneurysm and cleaning around it, so you can put your final clip You can see the view now. You can't go wrong in these cases. And that's how you achieve a very good clipping of this aneurysm. Now, the same type of aneurysm, this is the post-op, the same type of aneurysm, this is what the referrals I get. This is one of our fellows, Ruben. You can see the coils in a growing aneurysm. 35-year-old became a problem to deal with in this case. However, this aneurysm was like this, even better than the aneurysm that I have done. So I think we are missing on giving patients a great treatment in a good number of them. And it is, this is a meta-analysis on, on different reported uh, series. And it clearly shows that the uh, Microsurgical treatment is superior because you achieve complete occlusion and lower space. Even recently, I was reading the, the closure rate of aneurysms in, in this new web device uh, in a study from France is about 55%. We, we cannot accept key, you know, to keep lowering our standard because we're going to end up with cases like this nonstop catastrophes like this with massive strokes in the brainstem. And we don't talk about, you know, surgery when we talk about endovascular failures. It's like the whole uh, discussion is taken away from us. So what happens, the result is our standard has fallen and we're accepting a lower bar and we're not asking ourselves for something stronger and better for our patients. And this is not good. This is gonna result in a lot of bad cases. And to me, one case, this idea that I'm successful in 95%, I have only 5% failures. Those 5% failures are 100% for their family. And we have to do something about it. And if we think like this, we can do better. These are large cases. But this is not a problem case because the neck is what counts. You can see the reconstruction that we're able to achieve in those cases. Similar cases, many, many examples for which we can achieve. This is a way I wanted to choose. This is a case we did last week or so. 
very bulbous aneurysm. You can see it's a white base. And uh, you may want to consider this for different endovascular procedures. It's a high location. You can see the, the way the, pica, the posterior cerebrals come down on it. But what can be achieved in this case, again, this is the aneurysm. You can see how high it is. But this approach it allows you to go down in the middle fossa and look up and get the whole view of it. So these are the steps of the approach. And this is the middle fossa exposed. You see how far I am down here, the meningeal orbital branch. So I'll go over this for three minutes, there's a lot to, to talk about, but I think, you know, I hope this was enough to, to kind of send the message. And I'm very optimistic. You know, if I had 10 people attending today, I achieved my goal. Usually when I go to lectures, if I get one person who, is, who will convert and buy into the future of, cavernous sinus surgery, I achieved my goal. If today we have close to 900, boy, this is a big day. But it also tells you people are hungry to know how to do things better and more. So in this case, we opened the fissure and dissecting, this is the fourth nerve actually, then delineating the third nerve. You can see the third nerve, basilar artery can see the anatomy becoming more clear. This is PCOM. In this case, it was covering the view. So we went to a perforator free zone. It's a hypoplastic PCOM. And we cut it. Then when you angle the scope, you start seeing, but you can see that this is a very high aneurysm. And to bring the aneurysm down, there are little things that are important to understand. This is the, the dynamic aspect of, of these approaches. When the basilar is high, it's because the artery is filled with blood. When you put a clip, you can see perforators here below posterior uh, uh, superior cerebellum. When you put a clip, the whole system deflates. When it deflates, it drops down. Then your view becomes enhanced. You can see, you will see in a second, I can see the neck much better once I put the clip in place. So this is the clip on the perforator free zone. Then we will put a clip on the P1 on the opposite side. That's a P1 on the opposite side. And then all of a sudden, the view of the aneurysm you will see that's the third nerve, that's fourth nerve. Now we will angle the microscope and then all of a sudden the aneurysm dropped down. And then we can see around the aneurysm better. So when we apply our clip, it is no more buried inside the, we can see now the, the clip, the aneurysm collapse. This is the clip on it and we can see around it. We, this is a needle in the aneurysm collapsing it. You can see the mammillary bodies in this region. This was digging inside one of the mammillary bodies. So next, we will cut the uh, aneurysm to mobilize everything so I can see around it. But of course, this will not be done before verifying that there is no perforators around that region. This is the aneurysm being coagulated. And the final view, and remember this was a high aneurysm. And once we get everything out of the way, you can see the anatomy. This is the final view that you see everything around it. P1, P1 here and the clip at the end. And there's nothing hidden. That's the big advantage of this cured aneurysm instead of being different. 
there's many, many examples to show and ruptured, unruptured, low lying, et cetera. But I think, you know, we have, you know, taken everybody's time. I think it's a Saturday. A lot of people wants to, to uh, also go see their families. So I'm going to give the conclusion on the, our experience. This is now close, it's getting closer to 200 basilar apex aneurysms. The results are really good. Uh, the overall majority of patients of the ruptured group, 83% have excellent outcomes and independent. And the unruptured group, even better, 95% of these patients. With zero to one, which is very functional, fully functional, 92%. It is the times that I couldn't clip it is usually if there's coils or regrowth from referred cases from previous treatments. The way we handled the nerve with skeletonizing it, relieving the pressure, it always heals. So if we have the right passion and determination, we keep the courage of exploring new ways to do these things and keep that inner sense of our commitment, then we can do a lot that I cannot take the credit and I always thank those who have contributed to what I do, including also my fellows and my students and these uh, pioneers and friends. And, and I was lucky to have them as teachers. This picture that we had in Taipei uh, with Evandro, uh, always wanting to listen what he has to say. He, it was showed earlier, but let me I uh, would like everyone listening to, to send him some prayers for what he's going through. So it, it's important that we learn the cavernous sinus surgery because it's needed. And it really has unlimited potential. There's so much I can do now more and better because of my knowledge of that region. And it becomes simple when you master it. It's complex only when you're ignorant and you don't know much about it. And this is a, a nice picture to show of a painting that I know anyone who would try to do it will take a long time, but somebody who mastered it finished it in, in no time. This is like in five minutes on the TV, it was done. So um, nothing is impossible. I've heard it so much from my mentor, especially Professor Yazagil, who uh, kind of pushed me and, uh, and I, I want to tell the young people listening, uh, you don't want to jump like we have said earlier into the cavernous sinus, you should know your limits. Just you so saw that uh, what Cheshwa did, he did what is safe in his hands and helped the patient. But at the same time, in his mind, the reason he brought this case is because he knows that there shouldn't be limits for what we can achieve in the future. And if we use this guidance from Professor Yazagil to stay courageous, but use it with judgment, not in a reckless way, because who will suffer is a patient. And to do it, you need to have professional competence, which comes from going to the lab and learning from colleagues, and but not to give up. So for all those attending, you are part of a big pipeline, which is building up. I am really happy that there was 900 people listening only to a talk about the cavernous sinus and how to do cavernous sinus surgery. In the future, hopefully a lot of you will come and visit us with our courses. And like these guys who are here, a lot of them, some of the speakers. And uh, the future is very bright for uh, microneurosurgery and very bright for cavernous sinus surgery. This is some of our colleagues having fun in our lab. And uh, at the end, I want to, uh, sorry. I want to, to thank everybody who has contributed to this. 
I'm hoping this will be part of a future series on the cavernous sinus where we will come and do more uh, future steps. There is still a challenge that, that we have that we would like to achieve. Uh, and that's the, I'll throw it there because we need more young people to do it, is how to get rid of the carotid in, and replace it in five to 10 minutes because this will help us do more for certain tumors in the cavernous sinus. So again, thank you for everyone and uh, um, for uh, also those who helped us with organizing this, Dr. Aboud and Gina. And uh, I would like to see if anybody has any comments or uh, before we depart. And hopefully we will be meeting soon in, uh, in better circumstances. Thank you. We still have a good audience so far, which lasted with us. And uh, how many from China? So 860. 800, there's 860 people from China who are still interested in the cavernous sinus. We have to go learn from what they're gonna do pretty soon. <laughs> okay. All right, everybody is muted. You know that. You're all mute. So. Ah, thank you. Thank you, Professor, for this opportunity. It was a great learning for me, seeing you uh, going through the cases of increasing complexity that you demonstrated. And I picked up a few points from you. It's always, it's always so nice to learn from you. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you for Shashwad. the opportunity. Thank you, Shashwat. Thank you for participating here. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, and uh, for all our audience. And uh, uh, we'll hope to see you soon then. Thank you, Professor. Right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.